So, right, uh, Matthew, all good. Dun, dun, this works. Option one, two. <laughs> Don't get to setting things. Didn't get to setting things up. So, Matthew didn't get to set up. That is okay. That is okay. Here's the setup link. You can go ahead and start the installation and the setup. I'm um, actually, I'm going to walk through the setup also. So, we're going to spend about three, three and a half hours, three, four, three hours, 45 minutes with each other, really walking through all this Kubernetes stuff. Hello, James. I see you here uh, in the Q&A, at least. That is fantastic. Good to have you here. That's James Dean, by the way. In case you see a JD, that's James Dean, or James Dade, I'm kidding, uh, who's who's always with us or often with us for these kind of fun sessions. And actually, at this point, James, we're going to let you teach this class. How about that? Would that be kind of cool? We can do that. But I added uh, the link to the installation for what we're going to be walking through today. This is a live tutorial, though, so I want you guys to get hands on as much as possible. So go ahead and put as uh, go ahead and get Minikube installed if you can. Everything you see here, though, should work on your favorite Kubernetes. So Minikube is the one I default to for working on your laptop. But if you want to use the one that's built into Docker daemon here, like Docker for Mac, Docker for Windows, that one should work. Many of the students I've had before use that one. That one seems to work. And then also you can uh, use Kind, K-I-N-D. Uh, so K-I-N-D, Kubernetes, right? That's that's another popular option. The So that one might be the one you want. But Minikube is the one I typically work with uh, and have for a while now. So I know it actually works pretty well. And I'll add the link to the Minikube documentation there. But it doesn't really matter. I also have on my system, I also have an OpenShift running here. So I, in other words, I have a full real production ready cluster running on the Google Cloud, but I have Minikube running on my local laptop. So we're going to be having a lot of fun with these different options as we get through it. OK, uh, let's see here. Oh, oh and micro, micro, yes. So, so there's the micro K8S, micro K8S. That option is also growing in popularity. Uh, I've not personally tried that one, but you know, there's definitely people who love that one. So you might want to try give that one a try. But this is the hardest part, coming up with a Kubernetes that works for you. OK. And our goal here is to basically get you up and running with Kubernetes, get you some experience with Kubernetes, give you the basics of Kubernetes, but you'll see that we can cover a lot of ground depending on how fast we go. So just in this one document alone, we cover you know, the basics of getting things set up and how to use the kube control command line tool, where the pod is, replica set, all that kind of jazz, right? Even blue-green deployments, how to manipulate services. Uh, building images, resource limits. We can get into secrets and operators, custom resource definitions. So we can go pretty far with the tutorial that we have. And that's just one of the courses that if you guys want to dip into, we could dip into some others. Uh, for instance, here are my one of my standard presentations. I have a list of links here. We also can cover Istio, Knative, Quarkus, Kafka, Tecton, and even generic containers if we wanted to. Lots of ground we could cover, but we're going to mostly focus on the cube uh, Kubernetes basics. Okay, so here's what I want you guys to do. Well, I'll give you guys these two slide decks. Uh, we'll just we'll run through these slide decks since they match the course material a little bit better. So you can go to this link here. Okay, that link there, and that'll get you into this primary deck. You can see there's some folks already joined, and and this is your first cube talk ever. All right, all right. So we won't go too fast then. And you'll have to forgive me if I go too fast. I just tend to move rather fast, but we don't have to go fast today. Okay. Now, if you if you don't have a background in Linux, learning Kubernetes is a little bit of a, a chore because uh, to some degree, Kubernetes assumes you know some Linux. If you don't feel, uh, but that's okay. We'll t we'll show you some basic Linuxy things too. And actually, it's not really Linux. I'm running on a Mac here, for goodness sake. Uh, but there is some Linux containers that we'll be messing with over there. Uh, so the world of Linux containers came from the Linux community as a whole. Windows containers are under development. Of course, those require Windows servers and win uh, Windows worker nodes, but I don't do anything with Windows here. It is pretty much a Linux world that I live in here. Okay, so again, get your Minikube up and running on your operating system. And actually, I'm gonna go ahead and start mine up here. You'll notice we try to give you all the instructions for like if you're running on Mac, if you're running on Windows, you're running on Linux, you know, it's all basically the same stuff. You gotta get this Minikube binary downloaded. And in the case of a Linux type distribution, you need to make it an executable. You need to get a kube control uh, downloaded also. And by the way, there's lots of ways to download these guys. This is just a simple way to get it on your local machine. And of course, you want to make sure they're both in your path. Okay, those things have to be in your path. Uh, so so uh, if, I, if I just do a echo dollar path, 
I got to get those things somewhere in there, right? They just got to be in there someplace. And so you should be able to type in a mini cube version. There we go. And a cube control version. Those are two key th tools that you'll need to have access to. And you notice I'm getting this error message about localhost 8080. And that is because I don't have my cube config set up correctly. I don't have my cluster running at all yet. So some of these problems, some of these things start getting solved as we get going here. Do feel free though to throw questions at me in the Q&A panel. I have it up over here as well as the chat if you have comments or concerns. And then we're gonna kind of go through this process, all right? But go through, go ahead and get the installation working. As a matter of fact, let me, let me go ahead and see here. Uh, mini cube home, fine. Dun, 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 cube config, all right. You wanna get to set these environment variables. You can see there's a little windows tab here too. We will be working by the way from the command line. So, you know, you got to be comfortable with the command line. That is probably the hardest piece of the learning curve for Kubernetes is these command line tools. While there are point and clicky things, like if you have like uh, OpenShift here, right? You can do everything point and clicky if you want. But that is OpenShift, right? Which is a specific version of Kubernetes. And so to get the point and clicky part, you got to have a specific version of Kubernetes, right? You got to have the, the Google version, the Amazon version. Uh, and actually the Amazon version doesn't have much point and click. Uh, the Azure version, the, the Red Hat version, right? That kind of thing. If you deal with just kind of vanilla Kubernetes, then you're mostly dealing with the command line, which is a better way to learn in my opinion. All right. So you want to get those tools running. And let me, do, let me double check something here. This environment variable is very important to you because you're going to have things that populate in that file right there. So you can connect to your Kubernetes cluster. So you want to make sure that's set correctly. And that's what we basically, you know, are telling you here to do. Uh, also, if you, you can firewall, if you will, different Kubernetes clusters from each other by simply just having these different cube configs, right? Different, different config files. And so I do that a ton. I have, I typically keep my clusters firewalled from each other pretty well, meaning I don't like them to overlap. And there's this all the one, this other one here called Cube Editor. Here, let me double check that one. Okay, what that means, you, this will become important to you later, but we're gonna use a command called Cube Control Edit. And what it will do in this case is pop up Visual Studio Code instead of the normal VI experience that would provide for you. And that's a much nicer uh, editing environment. So that's another environment variable that's good to set. If you have Visual Studio Code and you can do something like code dot on the command line, Right, so Visual Studio Code popping up there as an example, okay? So that's a nice little tip. And we're gonna cover a lot of tips and tricks, by the way, for getting all uh, set up here. Uh, and James says he can teach everyone what not to do. <laughs> I just noticed that, all right? Uh, would it be crazy to try K, uh, K8 Kubernetes on my Raspberry Pi instead of VirtualBox? Yes, and here's why. Uh, you notice right here, we basically, when you we start Minikube up, we basically say, go ahead and give it eight gigs of RAM and three cores. And that's because we can do a lot with Kubernetes, okay? So, you know, if you only have a Raspberry Pi with, I forget the last Raspberry Pi rendition, it might have two gigs of RAM or something or one gig of RAM. And it, I think it does have four cores, but I'm not sure how it'll behave if, when you use this. So we basically need some resources. Uh, what a Raspberry Pi is good for is being a worker node, okay? And we're gonna hear more about what that means, but it shouldn't be the whole cluster. So if you have, Six Raspberry Pis, I would say go for it. If you have one Raspberry Pi, you're gonna be happier, I think, on your laptop. Uh, just to keep that in mind, a Raspberry Pi is just, just doesn't have much going on with it. So I'm gonna copy this command out. And you can see it says Minikube start, eight gigs of RAM. You can, of course, tune that. Uh, we won't be needing all eight gigs for what we're doing here today. So if you wanna tune that down to five gigs of RAM or something, you'll probably be fine with that. Maybe two cores instead of three if you need to go a little slimmer. I'm using Kubernetes 118 today. I'm using the VM driver or virtual box, depending on your machine, you might have KVM, you might have uh, uh, V, what is it, vSphere or whatever it's called. Uh, you know, you'll have to kind of look here and see what your different options are. Okay, Hyper-V on Windows, KVM, Parallels, et cetera. So you just want to kind of dig through the materials there to figure out which virtual uh, virtualization solution you would like to use. Okay, I use virtual box because it's available everywhere. And then dash P is your profile that gives it the profile name. So I'm gonna copy that and paste it in over here and let it start running. You can see it's gonna get going there. Uh, and that's gonna configure my environment for me. And if you do use VirtualBox, you'll see that, you'll see it pop up here, the VM, virtual machine pop into VirtualBox here, there it goes. 
So it's loading in now, starting it up, and then it's going to download a bunch of things from the internet to, to basically create that Kubernetes cluster right there inside that virtual machine. The nice thing about using this uh, VM-based solution, by the way, is you can discard the whole Minikube, discard that VM and recreate it from scratch. I do that almost every day. I did it today, as a matter of fact, right? So for you guys right now, I deleted my previous environment completely, and I'm rebuilding it from scratch right now. Okay. Uh, a couple minutes late. Could you please repost what links? Yes, yes. Do you want to make sure you have access to the installation guide and the written tutorial? So that's that one. Also, all the slideware. Uh, you'll want to make sure you have access to that and this. And I'll just give you access to all three of my decks because I teach this in a lot of different formats, as an example. And so they, you'll be a lot. There's some overlap in the slide decks, but there's a lot of fun stuff in there too. You want to check out. So make sure you have access to all those links. Uh, if you have at least 16 gigs of RAM, no, for CRW, James, you're going to want to have a 32 gig machine. For a mini cube, a 16 gig machine will be fine. Uh, but if you're going to go to, oh, if you're using CodeReady Workspaces, oh, I'm sorry, CodeReady Workspaces, not CRC. CodeReady Workspaces, that runs inside the cluster. I don't think you would run that on a 16 gig. Um, you need at least a 32 gig machine, I think, to run CRW inside your cluster there, as an example. So things take memory. So that's actually one thing you guys should understand right away. There's no magic here, though it looks like a lot of magic. There's no magic. Things still take memory. Things still uh, take CPU. We're just going to highly virtualize it and slice and dice it and overcommit it to death, OK? That's going to be what we're doing. So get started on the installation. It'll take a little while, by the way. So I got mine cranking up. All right. And actually, it's finished already. I say it takes a while. And look how fast mine worked this time. Some days it can be very slow. But I'm going to type in cube control cluster info. And see, I can tell that's on my little local environment here on 192.168.99, because that's what virtual box IP addresses look like. So cube control cluster info, cube control get nodes are two of the commands you should be able to work on right away. And I'll actually will paste this one into the chat so people have access to it. Okay, make sure you know what that command looks like, because then if you're running on a different cluster, like if I come over here and go to my Kubernetes cluster, uh, my OpenShift cluster on Google, I should say, cluster info, if I come here, uh, you can kind of see there it is, it's running at this IP address, which actually is a domain name. So it's actually running out on the public internet, uh, and I'm just connected to it from here, as an example. So this cube control cluster info tells you what cluster you're connected to, what cluster you're pointing at, and again, that is a factor of this thing called cube config. See that right there? There it is. And if you just cat that file, you'll see there's some nice stuff in there as an example. OK, so we'll come back to that more in a second. Um, yeah, I mistyped code ready containers, right? Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, with code ready containers, you need, you need big machines. And uh, we'll explain why that is in a second, all right? So code ready containers, by the way, is, is actually OpenShift for your laptop. But OpenShift is a fairly uh, out of the box enterprise ready Kubernetes. And so that's really what, so that's why it takes a lot more memory than let's say standard Minikube. All right, you, you'll get a chance to see some of that as we get going here. All right, so you have access to the slide deck. You have access to the tutorial. You should get going. Let's kind of dive into this thing and get, get moving here. Okay, here's gonna be our agenda. We're going to do this in two segments. We're going to do this one, and then we're going to do the second one, which is the elementary side of it. And then if we have time, we'll continue going further and just keep going through this material. OK, lots of fun here. It's fine if we're just ring winging it right. When you say winging it, do you mean you're getting it installed? OK, I'm hoping you guys are getting it installed because part of today's exercise is to get everyone installed and up and running as much as possible. It is hard, though, to get a Kubernetes cluster running on your laptop. I'm not going to say it's easy. Uh, it, you need to have decent hardware. A single Raspberry Pi won't cut it really. Uh, to run a whole cluster, a Raspberry Pi for one of the nodes is fine. We'll explain that in a second, but I would say a whole cluster would be tricky. So keep that in mind, but there's just a lot of stuff here, all right? A lot of stuff we're gonna be running. As a matter of fact, if you guys have ever run, let's say Spring Boot or Node.js or Quarkus or Python or Ruby on your machine before, think of it as running like, 25 of those things simultaneously, okay? Then you're more mentally in the right game, okay? Because this is a whole cloud unto itself. Maybe another way to think of it. It is not what you would think of as a single machine thing. 
Uh, let's see, having VirtualBox issues, that could be a problem. If you don't, if you're having VirtualBox issues, I'll give you one tip here. And that is on a Mac, use HyperKit instead. Okay, you got to install HyperKit also. And you can see here's the brew install for HyperKit. And when you basically say VM driver here, put in the word HyperKit. So that is your backup solution for, uh, and actually that's the primary for solution for many people on Mac. I use VirtualBox because I'm used to VirtualBox, but HyperKit is another option on the Mac as an example. So do try HyperKit if VirtualBox is acting up on you. All right. All right, all right, all right, all right. Okay, so here we go. All right, let's talk about some of this fun stuff. So why in the world do we have Kubernetes to begin with? Why is it the most important thing in your life at this moment? The most exciting thing in the entire industry that people are freaking out about. And it has to do with this one diagram that I chose to, to articulate a story around. It has to do with if you're old school or new school. Now, I'm an old guy. I'm actually old school. I love 80s music way more than I like 2020 music. So I am kind of old school. So let's say you are old school. Well, old school means you build a big old application. And in the case of Java E, right, if you're familiar with Java E, we would build a Java E application in an ear file with multiple war files with a bunch of jar files. That Java E application would easily grow to 10 megabyte, 40 megabyte, a gigabyte in size. And we would deploy that monolithic application every six months. And we were quite proud of ourselves, right? We could deploy that application every six months. It took 45 or 50 or 100 of us to, to build it, test it. We had manual, you know, we had 20 manual twist testers that had spreadsheets to check the box, you know, every time they tested a function of the application and we would ship it every six months. That's your old school world. The problem is the, uh, the world we live in doesn't want to wait around anymore right, for six month deployments. They don't want to wait around anymore for that gigabyte de uh, deliverable. They don't want to wait around for those 45, 50, 200 people to do their job. They want it faster, okay? They want it faster. They want, ship, they want to ship software faster. And that's why we live in this new school world where we have microservices. Now, there's a lot of ways to skin that cat when it comes to microservice, but we have all this new types of infrastructure that allows us to deploy applications ever faster. Okay, so if you want to think about breaking up that monolithic application into a series of microservices involving a network connection between the different microservices, it does mean you can have different teams with different pipelines and workflows at different delivery intervals, dropping their software off in production at their time. So if they don't want to ship every six months, they want to ship every six days, they could. You might have one team who wants to ship every six minutes, and that's possible too. Okay, uh, MS project. Yeah, don't tell us about MS project and Gantt charts for goodness sake, okay? Uh, then Hyper-V install micro eight. So you can do Docker desktop and Hyper-V, of course, on Windows. On a Windows machine, by the way, make sure you have the BIOS configured to allow virtualization. A lot of Windows machines come with uh, virtualization turned off. That might be one gotcha. And then a good tip from Adam Miller there on how to fix up VirtualBox on a Mac. Uh, and it can take a little time. Yes, yeah, so, but this is the fun part. Getting a VM running on your machine might be rather hard. All right, so the installation portion of it is the hardest part. Once you got the installation, the rest is easy. Okay, so let's keep going here. So here's a challenge. Here's why we care so much about this concept of the Linux container. Here's why we're so excited five years ago, six years ago when Docker was born and the world lit on fire and we were like, oh my God, this Docker thing is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. It allows me to actually run Linux on my Windows machine. So I had Windows and I could run a Linux virtual machine on that Windows machine and it was like magic, okay? Or I could run Linux on my Mac or I could run some other operating system on the other. And so we're talking about virtualization, but we're talking about a very specialized version of it because what this allowed us to do is con consider this configuration. In the old world, we would have to take our application and we'd have to define all the configuration steps associated with it. Like we need this version of a driver for the database. We might need this kind of data source configuration. We might this kind of app server as an example. We might need this kind of Java virtual machine and a different kind of operating system configured a certain way. And so this was challenging. Even the forward slash versus backslash burned people in production constantly because on Windows is one way, on Linux the other, okay? And this really messed people up. And see, Matthew is having some problems with Zoom. Uh, da, 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 da. <laughs> that might be true. Zoom is gonna eat some of your CPU. At the same time, Minikube is gonna eat some of your CPU. So you might have to adjust things accordingly to make sure Minikube and Zoom don't conflict on that same box. I'm actually running Zoom 
and I'm running this OBS, uh, OBS, which is giving me this green screen effect. I actually have a green screen here. So that, that allows me to do things like this as an example, if I want to have this view of it, uh, or if I have my elephant here. So I, I got that option also. Uh, but I'll go back to this mode to keep it, keep it more sane. But you do have to watch out for all that CPU usage. Uh, in my case, I got the latest and greatest Mac with 32 gigs of RAM and I think eight cores i9. So that does help me a little bit. Okay. But this concept, this challenge that you see here, this was hard. All right. This was really problematic for all of us. As a matter of fact, the way we solved it was by sending an email. Now, some of you, I know you folks are, are super cool. You basically, you know, didn't send an email. You had a wiki page instead. But you would basically email or update the wiki page to let your QA team know what it took to run the app, right? You're like, here's my new ear file, my jar file, my NPM, you know, my package.json, whatever it is you hand it over to the next team. You basically would document that and basically say, hey, guys, could you try to configure it this way? And I think it'll run. Okay, but the problem is your desktop and your production environment never actually matched, right? So you had a Windows desktop, you had a Red Hat Enterprise Linux production environment, you had a different version of the Java virtual machine, or V8 Node.js runtime, or C Python runtime, whatever it might have been. You had different forms of app servers configured there. Maybe you had Apache versus Nginx versus Web Server versus Web Logic versus JBoss. All this was a big hot mess, okay? And the email just didn't work. The email was always out of sync with the real runtime environment and therefore things would break in production. And you might've heard this phrase before. Well, it works on my machine. Well, guess what? We're gonna extend the works on my machine concept to it works on my cluster. That's what you're gonna be hearing going forward. It kind of works on every machine now, but not on your cluster versus my cluster. Okay, that's what we're, the world we're about to get into. Now this concept of the Docker file was part of the, the big part of the magic when it came to the Docker tool. It had the concept of taking that email, that wiki page and codifying it into a file that was essentially a piece of code, okay, a configuration file. But we could check this file into our source code repository, and anybody who checked the project out to their local machine could rebuild that container image just like the original developer had built it. So if the original developer had basically said, okay, I want this configuration file, I want this version of the operating system, this patch level of the operating system with this patch level of the JVM or V8 or Python or whatever else they needed for their app to run, you could basically recreate that world easily with the beauty of the Docker file. Again, it codified all those key elements and made it so you could easily put it all together. Now, here's the trick with just the Docker world, okay? Docker solved that problem. You could do a Docker build and you could do a Docker run and you would have exactly what Fred had on his laptop. You would have exactly what Sally configured when she built it on her laptop. You would have exactly what, you know, Jimmy had when he did it. And it was a beautiful thing. It was amazing uh, innovation. But it did have one challenge. That is a per container solution on a one container image and one container, easy. When you get into, let's say, that microservices architecture where you have 45 of these things, it gets complicated. As a matter of fact, if you have a microservices architecture, you usually have four, 10, 50, 500 of these things. And now you have to deal with managing it at scale or how to deal with port conflicts. For instance, if I'm running four spring boots on this laptop, I have four things trying to run on port 8080. Well, that's problematic. If I'm running a Tomcat and a Spring Boot, they're both living on 8080 because Spring Boot is Tomcat, right? If I also have some other different uh, application components running, I might have port conflicts as an example. And I definitely have issues with all these multiple hosts. So here's where we really get our head into what this Kubernetes thing really is, okay? Kubernetes allows you to take one, a bunch of computers and make them look like one computer, okay? So if I have, let's say six computers, and these are, might be my six Raspberry Pis, okay, or six virtual machines. As a matter of fact, uh, here, I'll go show you this real quick. This is my Google cluster running over here. So I have all these virtual machines running on my Google cluster as an example. So these are virtual machines. Think of them all as individual Raspberry Pis running out there on the Google cloud, but I've clustered those so with, with Kubernetes, with OpenShift, so they look like one. I can treat them as one. And that is really where the magic happens. So whenever you guys hear the term cluster, if you're not familiar with that, whenever someone says clustering, that often means the situation or the case of multiple computers acting as one. So if you have an in-memory data grid, as an example, well, those cluster. If you have a Kafka cluster, right? Kafka brokers have clusters also where there's three of them typically uh, working together. We'll actually show you some Kafka a little bit later as we go. 
Okay. Again, feel free to throw questions at me into the uh, into this into the chat. Okay. Da, 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 policies become quite complex, hard to maintain. So it looks like a really exciting project. I'm trying to understand. Oh, that's sorry. That was the previous session's question <laughs> on OPA. All right. Here we're doing more of the basics. Uh, let's see here. All right. Fantastic. So this is really where Kubernetes comes into it. Uh, it's it's uh, it's the foreground here, right? This is where it gets interesting. So Kubernetes as a term means helmsman or governor. I like to think of it as the admiral of the fleet of ships. Okay. That's another way to think of it. It is the admiral, not the captain. The captain of one ship is one thing. This is the admiral of all the ships, okay? Uh, is another way to say it. So it's a whole fleet of ships. Its goal is to have more than one computer. We're using a Minikube in a one computer setting, but it is not the normal way you would run it. Minikube is not for production. You would never run it in a production setting, at least, well, you're not supposed to at least. Uh, it is basically a single ship and a single node cluster, right? All in one. Your default cluster size with a Kubernetes should be three at a minimum three, and often it is five, right? Five seems to be about the sweet spot and it grows easily to 5,000, okay? Uh, you know, so maybe you want a thousand computers in that cluster or you want 5,000 computers in that cluster, but you would probably start off no, no fewer than three and you might go up to a thousand as an example. That tends to be the, the window in which people operate here with Kubernetes. All right, inspired by Google's experience with containers. If I was a Google person, I would sit here and tell you at Google, we launched 2 billion containers a week. We know containers is an example. Uh, open source project written in Go. So the Go programming language, of course, is enjoying a lot of popularity based on the fact that it's associated with the Kubernetes popularity as an example. All right, and the whole goal here is to help you manage machine, uh, manage applications and not machines. So it's trying to abstract the computers out there to make them all look virtually the same. So you just deploy your application and it lands and runs somewhere across those different com uh, computers, those different machines. Okay, so a lot of fun stuff here in Kubernetes land. Now, his microservices has been something we've been operating on for a long time, meaning we've been thinking about how we break up a monolithic project plan into smaller little project plans, right? We call that uh, extreme programming. We call that agile, the concept of a big old Gantt chart running a Microsoft, Microsoft project can be slimmed down into smaller little units as an example. And we might even refer to those things as sprints. So we figured out how to break up project plans into smaller project deliverables. And with sprints as an example, where we might actually have a deliverable every three weeks, if we have a three week sprint or two weeks with a two week sprint, or four weeks with a four week sprint. So we've been thinking about how to break up the process, the workflow, if you will, of how we work. But now we've been thinking about how we break up the app itself, okay? Instead of one big old code base and one repository where all 45 developers all contribute their code to, what if we actually break up the code base to maybe match the broken up project plan. In other words, the code base might have 25 little repos and those 45 developers are sprinkled across those 25 repos as an example. And so we would start thinking in terms of building smaller units of work, but we also now need this additional capability to help manage all those smaller units of work at scale. So Docker was born in 2013, Spring Boot born in 2013. Uh, you see microservices officially defined by the ThoughtWorks team, Fowler and Lewis on 2014. All right, and then Kubernetes born in 2014. I make that point because you can see we've been working on this for quite some time. Okay, so the world has started evolving, you know, back, back in 2012, 2013, 2014 to this new way of breaking up applications and making them much more uh, interesting to work with when it comes to deployment. Now, one thing I like to call your attention to, and you have this link here, go watch it on your own time, but that's where in 2015, we came out with Kubernetes. This is the demonstration I helped organize uh, for Red Hat, and we actually had a thousand containers launched live on stage. Now, here's something to understand. We launched a thousand Node.js little application servers live on stage. We did that in two and a half minutes. We launched a thousand little app servers and we invited everyone in the audience to whip out their phone, do a little drawing on their phone with their fingertip, and then they could upload that uh, image into their server. They could actually plant their flag on one of the servers that we launched live for them in two and a half minutes. The point of this presentation was to show you how amazingly flexible the Kubernetes architecture is and how fast it can be to light up a thousand applications on the fly. And as a matter of fact, that's 1,026. Uh, if you watch closely, you'll see those come to life in that YouTube video there. But that was back in 2015. So we've been working with this for quite some time. Now, here's a term you're gonna have to get used to, this concept of the pod, the P-O-D pod. And the pod 
right, is that container. So if you can, you can think of pod, container, container, pod, if your, your brain maps it that way, you're, you're okay. But a pod can be more than one container. And we'll explain that more when you get to the more advanced use cases, but we'll try to show you that. But a pod also is a family of whales, right? A group of whales. This is the Docker logo, by the way. Docker, of course, being kind of synonymous with the Linux container. But if I had two little whales, maybe that's a pod, okay, right? A family of whales. So I'd like that term of the pod. Uh, some people actually think this actually refers to the pod people from the invasion of the body snatchers. It does not. But the pod, of course, is the thing you're going to be working with on a regular basis. If you think about launching your code, running your app, that runs as a pod. Okay, your Node.js app runs as a pod. Your Python app runs as a pod. Your Java app runs as a pod. Your Web Server Web Logic JBoss app runs as a pod. Think of that as what it is. So pods are a group of contenders, not containers, but contenders. Brandon, that can that's kind of funny. Hmm, I would say <laughs> I, don't, I wouldn't call it a contender, but it is a container. Okay, all right. Now, so here's this concept of the pod. The pod is the component you primarily will be working with, right? So you care a lot about your pods. You love pods. Pods are the key thing. You want pods to be running and pods to be happy and pods to do what they're supposed to do because the pod really matters to you a lot. Now, the pod, of course, can be more than one container. Okay. All right. So Brandon containers, they're fantastic. Uh, so the pod can be more than one container. And we're going to see that. And I'll show you some advanced use cases where it really shines. So you can have the concept of like a sidecar container in with your main business logic container. There's really some cool stuff you can do there. But more than one container, they have a shared IP address. All right, they, they share an IP address. Therefore, you might have port conflict here. Don't try to launch two Tomcats in a pod, both on 8080. Put one of them on 9090, and then you'll be fine. But you could have two Tomcats in a pod if you wanted to. They have a shared storage, but it's ephemeral. So you can write to local disk in that pod, but this, the, as the pod recycles, the data goes away. So just keep that in mind. You would only use it for like a scratch kind of disk case, uh, a scratch purposes. And even that, I'm not sure if I would recommend it. Uh, you would probably want to actually have a shared volume underneath it. It has shared resources and shared life cycle. So all the containers come and go together within that pod. So just keep that in mind. The pod goes down, all containers go with it. When the pod comes up, the containers come back to life. Okay. So you got to just keep that in mind. If the pod is not running, you're not really using memory and CPU because your Tomcat's not really running. Your web server is not really running. Your Node.js is not really running until the container and the pod itself is running. Okay. Uh, oh, had to reboot. That's too bad, Matthew. Okay. Uh, but you can certainly pay attention as we go through this and listen in if you like, as opposed to doing the hands-on portion. But Here's a Kubernetes cluster. Remember I said earlier, the concept of the cluster is multiple computers working together in tandem, working together to support a use case. So you're gonna have, let's say nine computers here. That's what I have on the screen. I have node, node, node. So in Kubernetes land, a computer, a node is a computer, a node is a virtual machine. It can be real bare metal machine or virtual machine, but it is that computer or your Raspberry Pi for all intents and purposes. So we refer to that as a node. All right, N-O-D-E. The node was where you run your pods. Okay, so pods as processes live inside that node, as an example. And so you again, I have six drawn here on this screen. We also have what's called the master. And actually, the master is being renamed. Uh, you know, we're no longer going to use the term master going forward. I think supervisor is what it's being renamed to. I haven't checked the documentation in the last couple of days to see if it's been renamed yet. But the, the there's three nodes here, which are the supervisors or the master nodes. The reason there's three is because of this little guy right here called etcd. etcd is a database, an in-memory database, and the database needs three to be highly available. So that's why we say the magic number is three, no less than three. If you go less than three, then you might have a database that gets corrupted or a database that goes down, and then you can't interact with your application or your any of your applications anymore. Okay, there are some people working on single node clusters. Uh, the Minikube itself is a single node cluster where all these things live inside one virtual machine known as the Minikube virtual machine running a virtual box, hyper kit, et cetera, et cetera. Now you have your API, which basically is your create, read, update, delete, your RESTful API that talks to that etcd, writes records to that etcd, deletes records from that etcd. And then once that record is stored there, there's schedulers and controllers to take over for determining what to do with that record that landed in etcd. So if you built a Node.js application before, a Python web-based API, a, a Java JAXRS or Spring MVC style app, 
you've built apps this way where it's a public RESTful API interacting with your database. That's normal behavior for you. So I'm sure that you would have, um, uh, I'm sure that you would actually have, you know, this concept hopefully okay in your head. The magic is the scheduler and controllers, these guys kicking in and basically looking at that record and going, hmm, what do we do with that request? Okay, and it interacts with these kubelets to basically make that request real in the real world. So three masters out of six. Yes, so if you have six total nodes, typically three of them are masters. Uh, and, you know, because you want three masters as an, at a minimum. Here, I'll show you that. Let's come over here to my, uh, my Google one again. Cube CTL, Cube Control, get nodes. Here I have, it should be the total of six. All right, I have the three masters and the three workers. Okay, three masters, three workers. Now, typically what you have is three masters, two workers. That would be often your minimal set. You can also make your master schedulable. So work, the workers, the work goes to the masters. I've done that before also. So you can't get down to the just the three masters, but three masters is typically your minimum. Unless you live in a world like, uh, there is another Kubernetes option out there called uh, K3S as an example. Uh, and that one replaced etcd, so it can actually go to a single node. Okay, so it, it carries its own database. I forget what it is uh, at this point. So that is your typical architecture there, right? what you see right there. If I go back to my mini cube, however, and do cube control get nodes. Okay, you'll see there's just one node. That's the master node. So it's a master and worker all in one. If I say cube control get pods dash dash all namespaces, you'll see that it actually has that etcd, API server, controller, scheduler, right? So those things that we mentioned already are here even in this little mini cube versus what's running in that big cluster as an example, okay? Uh, K3S does run on Raspberry Pi, that is true. So James, three infranodes. So the reason you would have the three infranodes is because you want to take other parts that aren't quite master components. For instance, your HA proxy, which represents your ingress. Often your ingress goes on the infranodes. Or if you had distributed uh, virtualized storage, maybe that goes on your infranodes as opposed to your masters or your workers, as an example. Okay, so you might have infranodes also. Uh, that's more of an OpenShift thing than a regular Kubernetes thing. OpenShift has that uh, certain type of solution. And it, well, you, what you would lighten up the load on those masters for etcd, yeah. So etcd is taking up CPU resources on those three masters, and you want to offload CPU and memory so etcd can do its job. Okay, but hopefully for those of you who are brand new to what we just talked about, you're now thinking, okay, this Kubernetes thing is maybe not what I expected. Kubernetes is a cluster of resources. It is a big thing. Okay. Minikube is a small thing, K3S is a small thing, but Kubernetes is meant to be used at scale, all right? Think of it as running all the applications for your entire company. That's really what it's there for. That's why when Google says they launch 2 billion containers a week is because they run all the stuff you run at Google in containers, okay? Uh, so it is kind of a big deal and takes a lot of work. And actually I just lost the QA panel. Let me pull it back up here. Come on, QA panel, there it is again. Make sure we don't lose it. All right, so hopefully that answers your question, Andrew. Uh, three masters out of six, all right. And in this case, I do have nine blocks here. Nine is not the minimum, three is the minimum, but you you know, you pick and choose. Your applications, of course, use these nodes and you have to decide what you want to run out there. Now, all this is done in a declarative way. You will basically say, I want to run my Tomcat V1 here four times, four replicas of Tomcat. And the reason I want four replicas of Tomcat is because one, I have a lot of inbound load from my user base, and therefore I need more than one Tomcat. I also want some highly available, you know, HA qualities about the application. So I need a minimum of two Tomcats uh, in order to do highly available and load balancing across them. So, you know, four Tomcats gives us some redundancy. If one of our Tomcats dies, we still have three left. If two of them die, we still have two left. If three of them die, we still have one left. And we can be scurrying around trying to figure out how to get our Tomcats back to life and the load is distributed across the four of them. So you might have that Tomcat show up in four different places here in our cluster. That's often what you would do. So again, if one of these nodes goes away, let's say someone pulls the power plug on that server, that Raspberry Pi is sm smashed 
right? Then this thing might fail. So what if the Raspberry Pi here gets killed, the VM dies, and by the way, VMs do die. I've actually killed one out at Amazon before. <laughs> you know, you can easily overload a VM and it might just die and go away. But what happens is Kubernetes knows that that thing died and it realizes you still want four Tomcats, so it finds another place in the cluster to run your Tomcat. And it also, uh, depending on your Kubernetes version, it'll see that if the node really does die, it'll figure out that all those uh, processes that were running there, like the uh, PG admin, which is Postgres, the Spring Boot here, the Wildfly, it'll schedule those elsewhere in the cluster. Okay, in other words, it'll find a new home for it elsewhere in the cluster, and it'll try to rebuild that node and bring it back to life so that your whole environment looks good again. Okay, so it will work pretty hard to put all these things together. So our pod is the same as nodes. No, pod is like my Tomcat. And I have on this node, my, my Tomcat pod, my Wildfly pod, my Spring Boot pod, my uh, Postgres pod. Or maybe I have my Node.js pod, my MySQL pod, my Tomcat pod, my Spring pod, all running on the node. So typically you have more than one no pod per node. That's not required, by the way. You can do one pod per node. But that's like basically saying uh, your computer can only run one process. And right now, if you're using a computer to act, interact with us on this call, you're using Zoom, which is a process. You're using Minikube, which is a process. And you probably have Chrome running, which is a lot of processes, and Firefox and Safari and who knows what else. So you can have many processes running on a single computer. And that's kind of the concept your head should be in when it comes to these pods running on those nodes. They are just processes running on that computer. OK? Uh, all right, let's keep going here. Let's actually show you a little demo all right, of, of how do we mess around here? Now, my mini cube came up already, okay? So I said, I'm gonna say cube CTO cluster info. That tells me what cluster I'm connected to. And again, that's based on this cube config variable. And where is that, you know, you, got, you should know where that is. It also, by the way, if this gets a little screwed up at times, you know, feel free to wipe it out every now and then. Uh, you know, I'm not gonna do it now since my cluster is already up and that would be a little confusing. But you could wipe it out from time to time, get it clean, and recreate that Minikube environment from scratch. I do it all the time. All right, that, that's a really nice thing about Minikube. And when, even when it comes to my big clusters, like this big cluster I have running over here, I just recreated it this morning. You can see it's only been running for three hours and 47 minutes. So I recreate my big clusters all the time, depending on what I need as an example. So think of clusters as something that's fairly ephemeral also. You can recreate them. Okay, so you basically are going to say kubectl get namespaces. So one thing to understand about a Kubernetes cluster, it has a concept of namespaces, which are, think of them as folders or directories where you put stuff, all right? You're going to have stuff in a folder like you would on your hard drive or stuff in a directory. Very similar concept with namespaces. Namespaces have some additional properties. Uh, uh, so uh, clusters are like cattle, not pets. That's very true. I treat mine like cattle, not pets. However, Kubernetes does allow you to treat it as a pet, if you're familiar with that concept of cattle versus pets. We definitely have customers at Red Hat who treat their clusters like pets, and, uh, and many of them do, actually. I mean, they have clusters with a 1,000 servers inside them uh, with tens of thousands of applications running on them, and they treat it like a pet. <laughs> so I actually treat mine like cattle, but some people might treat it like a pet, as an example. OK? So know about get namespaces because that's going to basically tell you where things are running. Okay, that's an important thing. And you can say, uh, and you can also know what namespace you're in. And this is actually one of those special tools we mentioned. It's called KubeNS. So if you actually look back at our documentation, one of the tools we recommend you install, uh, you don't have to install all of these, by the way, but some of them are pretty valuable and we'll call them out as we go, is kubectx. So you do a brew install kubectx. And that's a really nice little command line tool for basically helping you understand more about the cluster you're connected to and what namespace you're in. So QMNS tells you what namespace you're in. All right, so that's the one you're already following. You can think of it as like PWD, if you're familiar with the Linux command for what namespace am I in, okay? You treat it like a boil, which means you might blow it up, right, James? Just kill it every now and then. We got the mini cube installed. We got the cube control installed. Another great tool is Stern. We're gonna hear more about that later. That's for helping you get logs logs out of the cluster, really great tool. Uh, Git for Git cloning, the thing we're looking at right here. So you will want to Git clone this whole repo and pull it down. So the repo with the documentation is also the repo we'll use for our samples as an example here. Still having trouble with Minikube? Well, if you want, try Docker right here. You can go to Docker, preferences, 
And if you have Docker for Mac, Docker for Windows, and the Kubernetes just needs to be turned on. I have mine turned off because I'm using Minikube for my Kubernetes. That's another option for you. And the, um, uh, but when it comes to your Minikube, it could be a lot of different things. It should be noted, by the way, that any given Kubernetes distribution fails on any given laptop. No two laptops are configured the same, and therefore you might have all sorts of problems making Kubernetes run on your machine. And I'll give you one more tip though. Let's say that um, you want a Kubernetes cluster and your laptop just won't get there from here. Your laptop is either too underpowered or your laptop just won't run virtualization correctly. A lot of them don't, especially if they're Windows machines. They just don't have uh, virtualization uh, capable of running. You also, if you have an enterprise laptop, meaning your big bank or your big government gave you an enterprise laptop, often those are configured never to run these sorts of things. So you can never make things run there. You don't have installation privileges. You don't have administrative control. So I'll tell you what, go to DigitalOcean, okay? Sign in, sign up and run a Kubernetes cluster there. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, here, let me see. Uh, well, I don't even remember my address. Well, let me see. Uh, maybe I'm with Google. I can't remember how I configured this. It's been too long. Let me see if it's with my Google account. But just go to DigitalOcean uh, and you can just click and launch a cluster as an example. Okay. Here's another, here's another option for you for just today. So you can come right here to this URL and this will give you a one hour cluster. So it costs you nothing other than a click and you get a one hour cluster. Uh, so just keep that in mind. It's only good for one hour. We're going to be here for another three hours. So just bear that in mind, but that will get you into a cluster super easy. Also with no money, no credit card as an example. Uh, and you'll be able to do some of the same things we're doing here. So that's another way to get a cluster. So there's lots of ways to get a cluster uh, in this world, but you just have to know which one you want. Okay. Can you send these links on chat? Yeah. Uh, oh, you mean like the DigitalOcean one? I think so. Okay. DigitalOcean. Uh, yes. On that, on that one that I showed you with OpenShift here, that is a one hour cluster. But a nice thing about it is free. DigitalOcean is also another option. There's also, there's lots of ways to get one. Uh, K3S might be another option for you. It works on some machines that Minikube won't work on, but you just kind of have to try all these different options to get one that works for you, okay? Um, kind is another one that's very popular that works for people. And, but again, I tend to use Minikube. Now, the good news is once you get beyond the cluster is running, everything basically works the same, okay? You just got to get a cluster running. All right, so we got this here. We started our cluster. Uh, you don't have to worry about this part of it right now. You can later, you can ignore this step. Basically, you can map your Docker daemon uh, into the Minikube directly, which is kind of clever. Okay, well, let's look over here into the uh, beginner section. So you should know about your cube control, config view, you get nodes, nodes show uh, namespaces, show labels, uh, get pods on namespaces. We kind of showed you these options. Okay, all that there. All good stuff. Make sure that you, you know, know about these commands. So there's my get pods, all namespaces, finds all pods across all namespaces. You can see right now we have a kind of a bare bones environment, just cube system. Okay. In the, let's see, term NSF term that involves clustering its name. I don't know what NSFW stands for anymore. <laughs> um, then I got this error, error, let's see, cluster info. Dun, dun, dun. Yes, uh, so if you're getting the local host error, it's because your cube config is not set correctly. Cube control cluster info. And let's see, I think mine should not have an error. Yeah, because mine's configured correctly. So check this value, cube echo cube config, and see what it's set to and get it set correctly. <laughs> That's the magic trick right there. You got to get that variable set correctly. All right. Uh, and, uh, you know, I actually had it set prior to launching Minikube. So I know where it is. So if you, you know what I mean? You might have to kind of look at your Minikube startup to figure out what happened to it. Okay. Where did it go? Uh, config view. Okay. All the, see, when I do a config view, this is pointing to that, uh, that file. All right. It's pointing to this file. So you got to know where that file is. Uh, and of course, Kubernetes has to know where that file is. That's basically how it knows how to find its cluster. Uh-huh. 
the, yeah, we don't give you a cube config because that is unique to your world. Every cube config is unique to you, pretty much. All right, so you want to create one. It generates it automatically when you do your mini cube start. Okay, now it you should go ahead and export cube config to something like you know my directory, a, a directory, a place I remember config. Okay, you want to make sure you're pointing someplace. And when you do your Minikube start, it'll populate it for you. All right. Now, if someone has a cluster for you, okay, if someone's given you a cluster, then they will give you this cube config file. Or they might they might give you this cube config file. But in the case of Minikube, it's your cluster, you own it, you're the cluster administrator, therefore you're responsible for managing your cube config file. Okay. Yep, yep, yep. So I think that uh, again, this is the hardest part getting the cluster <laughs> and getting the cluster up and running on a machine. That is the hardest part. Once you have the cluster, life is gold, gold, all right? Now, some commands here you should be familiar with. Get pods, all namespaces, show labels. And actually, one thing I forgot to mention here, I just zoomed, I zoomed through this too fast. Okay, let me come back here. The concept of label, there's this key value pairs called labels associated with all Kubernetes objects, all right? And just get your head around the concept. There's a, a thing of it as a tagging system. It is really just a name value, a key value pair, and they're associated with everything. Okay. So when you say dash dash show labels, like in this command here, that means you want to see what those labels are. And so therefore, if you use that cube control get pods all namespaces, show labels, you'll see the little labels out here. And that could be very valuable to you. What is the, you know, there you might see production, development, et cetera. What is the Kubernetes preload? I'm not sure what that question means, Savannah. Uh, Kubernetes preload. But if you look at your mini cube here, the one we're dealing with, this is what comes out of the box for mini cube. Your, depending on the cluster you're talking to, it might come with out of the box other features. Like uh, here, I'll show you this one here on my big enterprise-y one. All right. You'll see that it comes with a lot of stuff out of the box. Uh, Software-defined network. In this case, I've also installed Knative for serverless capability. Uh, OVS, right? Uh, it has Tecton. I got Tecton pipelines in here. I've got Kiali, Jaeger, Istio for Istio service mesh technology. I've got Kafka in here, Elasticsearch. Uh, what else? I got the object, uh, operator lifecycle manager. You know, Thanos. You know, Thanos, Prometheus, Grafana. I've got a lot of stuff running in this other cluster, as an example. So that get pods all namespaces gives you a feel for what the heck is running in this set of machines as an example. Okay, downloading the 118.6 preload. So I don't, oh, it's when, if that's Minikube start, it's loading Kubernetes into that virtual machine. So if you come over here and look at this virtual machine, it's running, but until Minikube loads it up, it's got to load it with a bunch of stuff. It's got to load it with all the stuff you see here, all right? Uh, get pods. Well, get pods on any space. It's putting all these things in there for you. And it's doing that, by the way, by installing container images for you. So the, the preloading would be the installation of Kubernetes into that cluster. That should be what it's doing. The nice thing is if you stop it and start it again, it'll already be there, okay? In other words, if you just stop and start as opposed to delete, it'll already have those cached, okay? Now in this section, we're in the cube control section here. Let me paste that in so you can see where I'm at. All right, double checking my Q&A tab here. So what you're going to do when you want to see if your Kubernetes cluster is happy, again, you use the cluster info, the config view, the get pods, those, tri those tricks to see what's going on. And then you're going to create a namespace, OK? Create a namespace for stuff, all right, for where you're going to put your stuff. So I'm going to say cube control, create namespace. I can call it my stuff. Let's just keep it my stuff to make it simple. Now I'm going to say cube control, get namespaces. And as I mentioned, you know, we're in kind of a com uh, command line environment, CLI environment. We're doing a lot of typing because in a Kubernetes world, this is the primary you interact with it. Again, different Kubernetes distributions have GUIs. Like if I wanted to do the same thing over here, I would say create project, my stuff. So I have a GUI over here in OpenShift land and your, your vendor may have a GUI for you also. 
Okay, but that's the same idea, but what I just did. Now, if I do my cube and S again, you can see it's still pointing to default and I really want to point it to my stuff. So cube and S, my stuff, that gets me there. All right, now it's pointing to my stuff. Or if you look at the documentation that we have here, you can use this longer command to basically get it to be your default namespace so that you're, you know, you know which namespace you're working in. So let me go back to default here, kubectl uh, cube and S. See default is now the default. And if I wanna make my stuff the default, there we go. All right, now that's my stuff. All right, so just keep that in mind. You wanna know what namespace you're in. That's very important you know what namespace is because you'll be installing things and you'll be lost. It's like, what namespace is that in? Now it should be known a namespace, again, is just a folder structure. It has really nothing to do with the nodes or the pods per se, uh, right? The, the it, it basically is just a way to group things, all right? A way to group things more than anything else. So now I'm gonna do this create deployment. So if you look right here, the create deployment basically pulls an image from Quay.io RH developers Quarkus dash demo v1. So this is a container image. Now, if typically if you dealt with containers before, you probably dealt with Docker IO, which is the default if you don't specify the uh, registry or repository, but you also will have uh, uh, things coming from other locations also. So as a matter of fact, let me show you this real quick. Uh, well, sorry, let me come here. Remember this last line I mentioned down here at the bottom that you don't really have to do. Let me, I'm gonna go ahead and do it anyway. Let me run it. Because what this does, it allows me to do things like this now, Docker images. And see those Docker images actually are coming from the Minikube Docker daemon. That's what we've done here. Okay, uh, so if I do Minikube Docker env, you'll see it's just setting up the environment variables. Uh, let, dun, 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 dun. let me first be in the right profile, dev nation and docker env says so just setting these environment variables. But because of that, my docker command line tool is no longer talking to this docker daemon over here. It's talking to the one in minikube. So if I do docker images, you can see there's some from GCRIO, that's the Google repository. And so that's where the image came from. And now if I wanna run this other command, the create deployment command, this one right here, and run it. Okay, I do Docker images. All right, let's see here. Watch, 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 cube control, get pods. Okay, oh, 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 there's my app. Uh, well, a cube CTO, get deployments. All right, great, all right, so there's my app. There's my pod. We're gonna hear more about these components in a second. Get RS. All right, good. All right, so I got everything I was expecting there. Okay, but the create deployment basically is the easiest way to launch your image into your Kubernetes. Okay, so you gotta have an image first. So this image might be MySQL, it might be Postgres, it might be you know Ghost if you're into Node.js and blogging, right? It might be WordPress. In this case, it's this little Quarkus demo, but that is the fastest way to get the thing launched into your Kubernetes to see if in fact things are gonna run correctly. Okay, to so see if you can run some code there. Now, one thing I forgot to show you, but you'll want to watch your events and here's why. All right, watch your events because you'll see the, uh, the life cycle happen. You'll see that when I basically made that create deployment request, that is going into the API, that's going into etcd, etcd is then basically letting uh, you know the schedulers and controllers know hey there's a request to run this thing called the corcus uh, demo okay so it's scheduled it's got to then pull the image so think of this as docker pull if you're familiar with that command pulling the image from that location on the internet down to this machine uh, successful create scaling replica set pulled so in other words i have finished pulling the image and then I'm gonna create the container Quarkus demo and it's gonna be started and you're gonna see it as status running here, ready one for one. So when you see running and one for one as opposed to zero for one, that is how you know things are okay. Okay, so that is running my little application, my little Java application here on this local machine uh, inside that Kubernetes cluster. Now, you might be running, well, how do you know that it's there? How do you, how do you check that it's okay? All right, how do you know that it's okay? All right, we're gonna come in here and we're gonna say cube control exec IT. And we're gonna basically 
exec into this pod. I'm going to paste the pod name in right there, dash, dash, bin, bash. So then I can say curl localhost because I'm now inside that pod or inside that container. And I can say curl localhost. And there it is. That's the little running application running on this machine. So if you guys can run that same command, let's see how many people can get that running. How many people have gotten this far? And here I'll paste this command into the chat. How many, well, I, know, I didn't copy it correctly. How many people have gotten this far though? They can actually see that thing running. They, they created the deployment and they got it running right there. All right, Mark's got it running, fantastic. Uh, Paul, question, what is the typical security that people make when running a Kubernetes? Okay, so what are, the, what are the typical mistakes related to security that people make when running Kubernetes out of the gate? Uh, the easiest one is they do not secure this API endpoint, all right? So if I go back over here to this little drawing, right, there's, a pub, there's an API that's exposed. You need to lock that thing down, okay? Because anybody who has access to the API has control of your cluster. <laughs> so it's important that you make sure that that API is not exposed. That is probably the most, the biggest ones. The other one that Red Hat is a big stickler on is when you launch these images into your cluster, we recommend those images do not run as root. Therefore, if someone does break into the pod and into that container, they are not root on that machine, as an example. That's another big one, okay? Uh, and there'll be, there could be some others that we think of along the way, but those are two big ones that I remember off the top of my head. Let's see here. Miniq is unable to connect to the VM. IO timeout. All right. Do you see on your virtual box surge? Do you see that your virtual box is running here? Do you got a little? You can basically load up the virtual box user interface and see that it's running here. Uh, that will tell you that at least something attempted to happen. And if it can't talk to it, then you probably have a networking issue on your computer. And those are really hard to debug. Um, it might just be a networking issue as why it can't connect to that virtual machine from Miniq. Uh, but do check that it's running inside your virtual box uh, if you said VM driver virtual box, okay? So you can also do, if Miniq start failed, you can also do a Miniq stop, see if that succeeds and try starting again. Uh, you can also just do a delete, wipe it out and come back and start again as an example. Uh, can I install K, uh, Kubernetes in a VM? Looks like no kernel support doing on a VM. No, no, uh, you can actually install Kubernetes on a bunch of VMs, okay? Uh, you normally don't do one VM, but you could in theory. So this this is the tool for that, Kube ADM. This is where uh, you wanna just go, you wanna be hardcore Linux and do it on your own as an example, okay? So you wanna be hardcore and do it on your own. So that would be one option for you. And it's a very popular option for people who are hardcore Linux sysadmins. They like using this uh, option as an example, you know, because I've actually never done it. I've always used Minikube or something else that gives me a cluster more easily as an example. Okay, all right. So when we're monitoring, you wanna monitor the events. So queue control get events is a way to kind of see the life cycle that's happening there. Now there's a couple other things that have happened. We have a deployment and we have a replica set. So when we did that create deployment, we ended up with three objects. kubectl get pods, okay? Cube control get deployment. You notice I use the term cube control get kubectl. I go back and forth there. And a replica set. You actually end up with three objects. You ended up with a deployment, my app, which created a replica set, which created your pods, okay? Or in this case, one pod. So that is often the way this goes. You create a deployment, which creates a replica set, which creates a pod. These are not guaranteed things, but you that's the normal behavior, especially if you're brand new to Kubernetes, just create a deployment, which creates a replica set, which creates a pod. So let's come back to this diagram here and discuss this a little bit more, okay? We have these terms here, all right? So the deployment and the replica set, its job is to try to maintain a certain number of replicas and it defines the pod template. And this is very important. So your deployment is smarter than your pod. The deployment is the pod template. It is the pod recipe, if you will. And that's where you put things that are that apply to all pods, okay? So let's say I want a certain set of health checks, a certain set of resource constraints, a certain image. Obviously the image is very critical. Like what image are we going to load? Okay, so that's a critical aspect of it. 
So that concept is all part of it here. So you wanna make sure that you use a deployment, which creates a replica set, which creates your pod. Okay, and we'll, we'll show you this more in a second. Also, when we're gonna, we're gonna also put a load balancer in front of our pods called a service. So a service is often almost always with a deployment. You'll have a deployment and a service. And the service is your load balancer in front of your pods. And the nice thing about that is this represents the DNS entry, the domain, uh, the, the name of the service. It gives it a real name, textual name. And it is the virtualized IP address, which maps to the IP addresses of the pods. So in other words, you, will, or you want your end users interacting with your service, not your pod IPs by default. Okay. And then there's this concept of a persistent volume. And that is if you want network addressable storage, and this is not ephemeral, this is persistent storage across multiple pod invocations, pods coming and going. Okay, let me show you a couple other things here. Now you got our one little pod running. This is, by the way, is a watch. I, I love the little watch command. All watch does is constantly run that same command every two seconds. So you can see there's our, there's our pod up and running. I don't have a service right now, kubectl get services, right? None of that, no services right now. If I see kube control get all, you'll see that we have the deployment, the replica set, and the pod. Let's actually kind of look at these things a little bit. Let's do a kube control edit. Remember that edit trick I told you? Here, let's uh, uh, echo kube editor. So uh, let's go kube control edit and the deployment my app. Let's see if that'll work for me. There we go. So now I'm editing that document. So what I just did was I went to the API, I pulled the document out of etcd back to my Visual Studio code here, and now I can make changes to the document. Okay, so this is just the YAML file, which represents the live running beast running in my environment. So I can make changes to it. So remember, as I said earlier, there was this pod template. So all this got created automatically for us when we just did that one create deployment command. It basically decided, okay, here's the container image and should it pull it if it's not present? So do pull it, right? If it's not already on this cluster as an example or on this node uh, specifically, uh, it has a rolling update support, you know, max storage, max unavailable. These are all fairly advanced things. So let's kind of ignore that for now. What I'm simply gonna show you is if I make this replicas three, hit save and close, you'll notice there's now two more replicas of that pod come to life. There's now three of those applications running on this machine, okay? So if I want to come in here and say Q control exec IT, and I want to go into this one, this is the one at the top of the list there. I say curl localhost 8080, okay? See, it basically provides its pod name and this numeral four, that is just an instance variable to let me know that that process is stayed up. So every time you hit it, it gives you a new number. It's an example. But if I exit out of here, and let's say I bust over to this guy, Q control exit, uh, exec, IT, dash dash, bin bash. All right, curl localhost 8080. And there it is, that's number one. So notice these numbers are different and these pod identifiers are different. This is nothing more than the host name. So if you're familiar with the environment variable called host name in your Node.js code, Python code, Java code, basically this code thinks its host is that pod, okay? The computer I'm running on is this one right here. So you, you kind of have to get your head around that. The pod is essentially the code's computer. The code is unaware it's running as a pod. The code is unaware it's running in this highly virtualized, crazy Kubernetes world. It just knows it's running, okay? And its host is that pod. So that's what we have when it comes to those three pods. And that's what the replica set concept does. So if I say kubectl get rs, you'll see we have a desired three, a current three. So the replica set's job is to make sure that if you say replicas three, 10, 30, one, whatever number you give it, its job is to make sure those uh, pods are up and running. And then we have the deployment. And then the deployment includes the pod template and everything else you need to basically govern that pod that we want to run. Okay, so those are, those are the objects you deal with a lot and the concept of the service. So let's go back into our, our tutorial here because we should have setting up the service coming up soon. Okay, so here's the fastest way to set up the service. I'm gonna just copy that one, paste it in. Okay, now I say kubectl get services. And so this, now this one's a little bit tricky 
depending on the Kubernetes cluster you're dealing with, uh, watch kubectl get services. And when you say type load balancer like we did there, you may see an external IP show up, but it would take some time, okay? It may take some time. So depending on if it's Google, GKE, if it's AKS, EKS, if it's OpenShift running in those three public clouds, you know, OpenShift runs across all those clouds, then you would get an IP address eventually. It takes time. And it actually then takes longer for it to resolve. Really. So you might have to wait a few minutes to get this to uh, go from pending to the IP address. In the case of Minikube, it pretty much always says pending. Okay, so like you see here, this pending won't change no matter how long we sit here looking at it. In the case of Minikube, it gives us this thing called a node port. So you see this 32536 here? That is the node port exposed from that node, the single node that we have here. All right, the single node we have here, available to the host. So the host, in this case, my Mac, is going to be able to see this thing at Minikube IP and then that node port. So I can say curl 192.168.99.132 colon 32 536. And there we go. So now talking to that application. Now look what's happening here. Look at the load balancing from this one right here, which is that guy in the middle, to this one. The ZJX5P, that's that one, to this one right here, the RDZ VJ right there. So the load balancing is built into the service construct. Okay. The service is a load balancer built right in. And now I have that load balancer working across those three pods. And this is kind of awesome. Okay. So you notice my curl command just keeps on working. As a matter of fact, let's copy and paste it and do something fun with it here. All right, so I'm gonna say while true, do curl, uh, sleep for a little bit, done, let it go and just pull. There we go, so now it's cooking along, bouncing up against those three pods. And if you notice, by the way, I use three different windows because I like doing this sort of demonstration, uh, but they're all configured the same way. I have, an, I have a script that basically, you know, ensures that my cube config is set the same. So cube CTL config view, I can do an echo, Cube config, right? That tells me they're all configured the same. Kubectl get nodes. So I like I like working this way. So my three they're three different terminals, but they're basically configured with the same environment. So I can kind of bounce back and forth. But let me go kubectl get deployments. Cube control edit deployment. My app. That's going to bring up Visual Studio Code. And let me come down here to replicas way down here. Let's make it two now. Save and close. And you'll see that one gets killed because I only want replicas equal two. Therefore, if I say kubectl get rs, you can see it's desired two. It's making two happen. One of the one of the previous ones is going away. It's gone. But notice my load balancer didn't have a problem at all. Right? It just bounced around that issue. It basically did not care. So if I add more, okay, let me do this one more time. Let me come here, replicas, let's make it five. Let's say I want five of these little guys running. Save and close. You'll see a bunch of coming up here and you might see an error message. Let's see if we see it. Okay, no, it's not, it's not gonna give us an error message, but there's something we'll teach you a little bit later as we get to some more advanced concepts. But you notice those new pods came to life. You can kind of see they started over at one. Uh, here, I'll, I'll stop this from scrolling so fast. But you can kind of see there's the H8, H8TGR, that's this one right here. It's only 22 seconds old. Here's the w, WRDWB, right? That's this one right here, 28 seconds old. Here, you know, you'll see the older one here, the RDZVJ. That one's been around a while, so it's a little counter is a little bit higher. So that concept, right, of that load balancer, that servers working across those different components is incredibly powerful, right? And again, you get the round robin load balancing for free. Okay, out of the box when it comes to Kubernetes. And that alone might be worth the price of admission. If you've never had to configure a load balancer before, it can be very painful. If you ever had to buy a load balancer before, it can be very expensive. And so this gives you something that gives you uh, a load balancer out of the box. And now you can try some really fun stuff there. Okay. Now, in the case of Minikube, we show you how to set up that IP address. You saw me do it manually, but you can configure it this way. So Minikube IP, 
And then you can go into the, grab the node port there. So you'll see this little command that's actually very powerful. Not only can you get something, okay, kubectl get pods. I can also get a single object, like get the service, my app here. And I can take out the slash if that makes it a little easier to read. Okay, and then I can say, pump it through this JSON path and rip out its node port. So this is a very powerful concept of the API. You can rip out parts of things. So if I say kubectl get service, my app, oh, JSON, you get the JSON version of that document over an etcd pulled back to you. You can also say, I want the YAML version. And there's the YAML version. But the JSON version is kind of nice because you can then parse it, OK? You can then go to jsonpath.com or .org, whatever it is. Uh, let's see here. Uh, GitHub, jsonpath.com. And then you can do some stuff here, all right? You can go fool around with that JSON uh, and figure out exactly how to rip out a piece of that, of that API, that document, OK? Let's see, has engineering come up with MTA, MTA that does not alias your Java code to a port in Quarkus yet? An MTA does not alias your Java code to a port. I don't quite know what you mean by MTA, James. So on your question there, uh, so the MTA, but for some reason I'm drawing a blank on that acronym. But the, I mean, if your Java code opens a port, that's the port, <laughs> okay? So, you know, if, if you think about it, if you don't open a port, you can't listen to transactions coming from the outside world, right? The port is basically your network interface, you know, the, the thing you're gonna listen on, right? Uh, that's your port, okay? And this node port is what we opened up uh, and then made it available. So all this stuff is part of the equation here. Ooh, let me see here. There we go, and you can kind of see what we did. Now, we, we modified the replicas, but we did that by using the edit trick. You could also do it by the command line here. Oh, oh, this is fun. Basically, let's change the image. So one thing that's super awesome here is you can also change the image on the fly. There we go, let me get my curl going again. And let me come over here and uh, edit my deployment again. Let's kind of make this more sane instead of five of those. All right, come on, let's get down to three again. So three and save. All right, there we go. So two are terminating, three are running. Again, the load balancer's happy, but watch this. We're gonna, what we're gonna do is we're gonna change the image out from underneath that deployment. And again, that represents the uh, uh, pod template, okay? We're gonna change it to a different image completely, which is a Spring Boot image. And watch what happens here. This is actually very important. This is the magic that Kubernetes offered to the world that blew people's minds. So you're going to do a rolling update here. And right now, if we do, if we do watch Q control get events, it's actually pulling that image. Okay, so it's still, once it gets it pulled, okay, so it's going to be going through and pulling that image. Once it gets pulled, it's going to launch it. Once it launches it, it's going to throw it into the load balancer automatically. See container creating here? That means it's still pulling. That pretty much what that means, pulling, 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 depending on the speed of your internet connection, the speed of the remote repository across the internet. You know, you might be pulling for a little while. Also depends on how big that image is. Smaller images pull faster than big images. I think that makes sense. And look what happened there, okay? It basically is rolling, updating now all those, all those guys from the Quarkus application to the Spring Boot application. You guys see that? MTA might stand for mail transport agent. Could be, I don't know. Uh, let's see, mail transport agent. So everyone thinks it's mail transport agent, James, MTA. <laughs> oh, you mean the migration toolkit. Ah, okay. Yeah, so on the migration toolkit, I've not looked to see exactly how it does port analysis. Uh, so James was asking about the migration toolkit, not the, my, the, my, not the mail transport agent. So migration toolkit. For applications. This is a tool you can use to analyze your applications and then decide if they're ready for Kubernetes or not. That's kind of the idea. Metropolitan Transport Authority. Yeah, that's a good one, Summer. Yep, the yeah, Metropolitan Transport Authority. I like that one. But this is what James was talking about. And I've not looked to see if it handles ports correctly or incorrectly or anything like that, right? Its job is primarily to look at your application to see how 
if it's Kubernetes ready or help to get it Kubernetes ready as an example, make it OpenShift ready. Okay. All right. So what, but you guys saw what happened here in this failure. Okay. Notice by the way, it's all good now. It says Aloha Spring Boot, but let's try this again. Okay. Let's actually run this set image one more time. I'm going to go to the V2 now. V2, you're going to see it do all its rolling update again. It's got to pull the image. So there it goes, trying to pull, giving us some errors, trying, trying. They noticed the V2 image came down faster because V2 is based on V1. And by the way, when we're doing these pulls, it only pulls the delta, the diff, if you will. So the V2 image came along faster, but look, we still got errors. Okay, we went from... Uh, Hold tight, everyone. I think we just lost Burr. He should probably be rejoining here shortly. All right, come on, come on, come on. Open. Or this is like a new, uh, an updated window. That's all the. Let's see, let's see. We had a network issue. Always makes it fun. Where's our chat? Let's go here. I wonder if we. I got you, Burr. Here, yeah. I, I figured you lost lost your connection there, so everybody stand by. Okay, here we come back. The <laughs> it is kind of funny, right? The the network just died here. Yeah. Okay, but it came back online. Let's see here. Let me open up the little tabs again. Zoom's coming back up. Where did the Q and A section go? Okay, here it is. Okay, all right, all right. You guys, all right, we're back. All right, still all right. Turn it off and on again. Often with your router, that is the best plan of action, by the way. So John, you know, if you got sometimes bouncing that router is the right way to go. Okay, let's see here. What we were gonna show you was that rolling update with the Quarkus image, where to go? It's way back here and I've forgotten it already. So Quarkus demo V1, come back here. And let's set that, well, not there, let's set it here. And we're gonna switch it over to the Quarkus image. Again, it's gonna do its rolling update. That's what we wanna show you. All right. Notice that with Quarkus, it flips right over without error. And it's purely based on the speed. Quarkus is a Java application, but it's insanely fast. And so therefore it, spin, it flips right over without a problem. While when we use these Spring Boot ones, which are more typical Java-based apps, you know, that's slow enough to start that you actually see an error. Like if I go back to Spring Boot here, you'll see an error. So just keep that in mind. 
okay? Just yes, keep that in mind, that you basically have this thing called a liveness probe and readiness probe, which are not yet set, that will help you deal with the, that outage right there. Because you don't want a production outage. Your users will see the, that outage and go, hey, they're, they'll file a ticket. They'll tweet that the, your system and API is down, and that's what you don't want, okay? All right, so let me see. Did we cover all the important things here? I think we did. Uh, let the scale of replica, set the image. Yeah, all that good stuff. And as a matter of fact, let me come over here and I'm gonna basically just run this last set of cleanup commands here. And we're gonna delete the whole namespace, my stuff. And that by the way, will terminate these three pods and wipe it all out. Just like if you delete a directory, it deletes the files in that directory. Same kind of concept here, it'll wipe out those pods. You'll notice also the deployment that we had earlier is gone. The service is gone. The replica set is gone. And I'm not gonna wait for that delete to happen, but if even if I'm trying to curl, it's all gone, okay? Everything's killed. And all it's waiting for right now is for those processes to properly shut down. And then of course the whole namespace goes away, okay? Namespaces. So it is still here right now. We can see it's in terminating status because I did kill it and it will eventually clean that up. Okay, all right. So this is basically what we just did here. We did the cube control area and we kind of walked you through that. And if you just get through this portion of it today, okay, this already is a massive win. You got your mini cube running, you deployed your first app, you've seen the real magic of Kubernetes, which is this concept of the service and this ability to do load balancing across that service and then do the rolling updates. Your rolling update is imperfect, right? You're getting errors with the rolling update, but that's okay. We show you how to clean that up as we go throughout this course but that is the magic of Kubernetes, all right? And you've seen the pod, you've seen the replica set and deployment, you've seen the service. We haven't got the persistent volumes that comes later. And technically you saw labels, we just didn't mess around with it too much, okay? So let me double check that we're covering all the key ground here. Uh, oh, we, we kind of hide a lot of this stuff, right? Uh, so let's see here. The, da, 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 okay. Uh, yeah, this is no, this run command is now old and deprecated. And as a matter of fact, let me see if it'll still even run for me. Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes default. Let me get to the default namespace. Okay, it still seems to be working. Okay, uh, so at some point they were deprecating some of these commands, but the create deployment command is the one you really want. Okay, it looks like it came up there. That is cool. Kubectl get all, and it gave me that pod. Okay, so let me just delete that pod. My boot. There we go, wipe it out. But do, you know, look at these different things for the uh, get namespaces, get pods, run, create, look at the logs, cube control logs, expose it as a service. And then of course you can scale the replicas, you can change the image. That's basically what we showed you in that section. Okay. And this is the magic. This is the hard part uh, of all these things. And the rest of this, by the way, is just slides for you to have. There's some free eBooks, things like that. But we're gonna simply just walk through the tutorial together. All right, let's kind of drill down now into this pod replica set and deployment another level. Yeah, it seems like we're gonna repeat ourselves here a little bit and we are because we wanna make sure you understand the concept here or at least have some experience with it to be comfortable with it because it's very important that your concept of the pod be, be a hole in your head. Not a hole in your head, but whole as in together. <laughs> okay, now here's one thing you can do. You can actually have a piece of YAML file this is a YAML file where you declare a pod against a certain image. I want a pod of this image as an example. So you can actually on a bash shell, a bash environment, like your Linux machine or Mac, you can copy that and come here and paste it in. Okay, and you should see, there it is, it's coming to life. And this is what's known as a naked pod. If you notice there was no deployment, no replica set. Uh, a link to the presentation, yep, links to the presentation. Are, this is this presentation here. And this is uh, the other ones we'll see a little bit later on, this one. And then if I also run this as another type of session called Nine Steps Awesome, you might see some slightly different slides here. All That's all open source slideware. And then of course we're in our tutorial document, which is right here, okay, right there. 
Okay, so what we've done is we've created what's called a naked pod. This is a pod without a replica set and without a deployment. Remember, a deployment creates a replica set, a replica set creates the pods. And the reason that's, that's cool, okay? So like I can come here and just do this exec command. Let me copy that, paste it in. All right, it'll, it'll by the way, that's a deprecated version. It should be dash dash uh, before the bin bash. But I can say curl localhost 8080. Okay, see, I'm talking to it, it's good. But here's what's funny about it. Here's what's bad about a naked pod. If I come over here and say kubectl, delete pod, and the name of the pod, the pod goes away. Okay, so here's an aspect of self-healing that Kubernetes has. If you use a replica set in a deployment, it will see that that pod is dying and it'll recreate it for you as an example. Where's the dev nation login? Dev nation login. I'm not sure what you mean by dev nation login. Like, uh, is there, do we ask for a login? There's no login to get to this document as an example. Uh, you know, so I'm not sure what you mean by dev nation login there, Brandon. Okay. But just know that a naked pod can be killed and it stays dead. All right. In the case of using a replica set, let's come use a replica set here the pod won't stay dead, okay? And this actually can be very confusing to people. So I'm gonna basically use a replica set, kubectl get rs, kubectl get pods. So we have our three pods, replica set set of one of three of them. Therefore we're getting three born up there. If I come here and delete the middle one, kubectl delete the middle one, watch what happens. Uh, or delete pod. There we go. It basically will kill the one I told it to kill, but then it respawns another because of the desired three. All right, so you want three, it's gonna to try to make three happen for you somewhere in that cluster. Uh, the pod is only mostly dead. So there is a great uh, Princess Bride reference right there. It is, <laughs> it is not mostly dead versus all dead if you're familiar with Princess Bride, but it actually is all dead. Okay, so from a process standpoint, that JVM, that V8, that WordPress, whatever it is, truly did die. However, the replica set responds it. So this is closer to what you see like in a video game. You know, in a video game where you get blasted, your health goes to zero and you're dead, but you pop up again onto the board, you might have lost all your, you know, your magic potions and swords and stuff like that. They are all scattered all over the ground when you died and you can start picking it back up again or the other competitors can pick it back up, but it's a respawning actually, all right? So the process actually is dead from a Linux standpoint, uh, but it'll really respawn. Uh, does post the links to the documents in the chat, please. Post the links to the documents in the chat. Which which documents? The, doc, the ones we pasted here, like this one. All right, there's that one. And there's these ones. But this is actually going to panelist. Oh, I see what the problem is. This silly little chat switched to panelist only and not and not attendees. Yeah, there we go. All right, all right. The chat defaulted to other speakers, not the actual attendees. All right, there you go. Hopefully those are the main documents you need. And uh, let's see here, would you go away? There's one thing bad about Zoom, the silly little thing that pops up above the top bar. And then here's my other one. All right, there you go. And then you'll see there's tons of other links there. All right, so the replica set respawns the pods, just so you're aware of it, what it looks like there. You can also use this command called describe to describe it. That's your friend, describe, get, describe, get. All right, you'll use those two commands a lot when it comes to these objects. And one thing I want you guys to start getting your heads around, these are just objects in a database, okay? The pod is an object in the database. The deployment is an object in a database. The replica set is an object, the database. So if I say get RS here, that gets me all replica sets. If I say kubectl get RS and this particular replica set, okay? So this is the type that I want to get, all right? So get a type, this specific instance, and then I can say, you know, sorry, there I get it. I then can say, oh, JSON. I can say, oh, YAML. And I'm pulling that document out of the Etsy database. Okay, I'm pulling it out of the Etsy database and I'm looking at it. And because I can look at it, I can also edit it. Okay, so let me try edit. I can now edit that same document and toss it back into the database. 
right? So this is a beautiful thing. So if I say I want replicas two, save, close, you'll see that it'll kill one and give us two because that's the new desired state. kubectl get rs. So everything in Kubernetes land works off this concept of a declaration. This, by the way, the editor trick one more time. All right. I map it to cube-w for new window and uh, sorry, code-w and that's my Visual Studio code, right? That's how that, if you don't have that set, uh, it'll just go, let's see here. If we unset it, edit tour. Okay, echo. Let's see if I got it unset correctly. I think so. And so let's do that edit command one more time. And it pulls it up in VI. So now you use VI commands for replicas. Okay, right. Okay, and then you got to dig around in here. And for those people who love VI, they're like, yes, I'm not a big lover of uh, VI. Let me see, uh, X. Oh man, I forgot to hit I. There we go. Four. W. Q. Let's see if I did it right. There we go. <laughs> so that's your default experience. Use that VI. Uh, yeah, nine steps awesome because I always ran nine different things, John. There, I ran like nine different components to get you up and running on Kubernetes. It's all the same content. Uh, basically, I now have a whole team of people helping me maintain the tutorial, so you can see it's really gotten robust over time. Well, that is the concept, right? You're pulling things in and out of that database. So let's actually delete the replica set and we get the deployment. Okay, notice this cat EOF trick cube control apply dash F. And then EOF, it's basically going to say, make everything in there just like it came from a file. So I can do that right there. Okay, and there we go. Another thing you should be aware of, and let me go ahead and do this. Do, 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 do. Actually, you go away over there. Okay, and let's come here. GitHub, Scholars, Kubernetes tutorial. This is what we're working off here on GitHub, there we go, come on, there we go. And then if I come to apps and let's just go to cube files and let me grab this my boot deployment here. You see that deployment YAML I'm going to raw mode. Okay, here's what it looks like. So this is your deployment YAML so in raw mode, that means no Chrome, no browser Chrome, no fancy stuff. I can just deploy that. So in other words, let me come back over here. Let me double, I'm just double checking and it all looks good to me. I can say cube control apply dash F and the URL. So as long as you can stream the YAML in somehow or another, right? Kubernetes takes it, writes it to the etcd database the schedulers and controllers kick in and go, okay, let me try to make it happen in the world. And now I have my little Spring Boot application running alongside my Quarkus application. So if I want to queue control exec IT into that pod dash dash bin bash, let's, we're going into the Spring Boot one here, curl localhost. Once you're in the pod, you can curl localhost. All right, there it is. If I want to queue control, queue control exec IT, and this guy right here, this one, uh, da, 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 da. how about again, copy, paste. There we go, dash dash, bin bash, and then curl local host. And there we go. So we're talking to that Quarkus one right there. Okay, the one in the middle. So that concept is often how you decide, is it working on Kubernetes or not, right? You get your deployment, you, it, get, it gets created. Uh, you look for the pods to show up. So here's my two deployments. You notice I have a watch cube control get pods and then I exec into the pod to see if it's okay. All right, that is my common paradigm to see if things are kind of sort of working. And then you go build a service that basically is the wrapper around it. Right now I don't have any services, but it doesn't, you don't actually have to have services, right? The, the pods themselves might be all you want in some cases, depending on how you're gonna access it. Uh, let me come over here and basically now delete these two deployments, my boot. And the Quarkus one, when I delete the deployment, it deletes the replica set, which and then it basically starts tearing down my old pods. Okay. What happens if you mess up the JSON YAML file and attempt to use it? 
the uh, yes. Yeah. So if in fact you have a, vi a validation error, so a question from John here. If you have a a um, if you have a validation error, let's see here. Let's actually cause a validation error. Uh, let's see. This by the way is still on my local machine. I did do the cube clone here, or get clone. So here's this one. Okay, no, don't mess with me here, VS Code. But let's say I really goofed this up. Uh, let's put in the word burr here. So the, the combination that matters is kind an API version. Kind is the object type. I'm doing a deployment, a replica set, a pod, a Kafka, a pizza, right? The cool thing is you can actually extend the API to give it any object type you want. Uh, but I'm gonna do a deployment and the API version. That's, that's the combination that has to matter. So I'm gonna say V1 burr, which doesn't really exist. And if I come over here and try to apply it, uh, dash F, and it's under apps, cube files, and I, that is my boot deployment dot YAML. Okay, it'll say, sorry, I don't know what that is. All right, so it doesn't know what a V1 burr is. So you're getting a, you're basically getting a, viol, a validation error. And let me try something else. Let me, I don't know, let's just kind of come here and whack a section of it. So save. Let's see if that, let's see if that gives us a little error. All right. Yep. Ignoring, it basically has a validation error. Okay. So if you jack up your, your file, normally it won't deploy. <laughs> oh, whoops. Oh man. Oh, there we go. All right. So get it back to right again. So now I, you know, the bare bones deployment is there and then I can deploy it. Uh, and notice also, by the way, I have the YAMLs tool from Visual Studio Code here. Okay, not that one, this one. Okay, the YAML tool. Uh, and so Red Hat, by the way, provides a YAML tool, which also helps you validate your YAMLs, which is nice. Uh, it, you know, so we also do the Java tools for Visual Studio Code out here as well. So if you're into Java, so if you're into Visual Studio Code, there's just a lot of great tools for helping you helping you manage your world, right? Uh, so the YAML tool is also very powerful. YAML and Java are two po most popular tools to be provided for Visual Studio Code. Okay, so there's that, and I don't need that open anymore. All right, and then so if I did it right, okay, there's the little boot running there, okay? Now, you might be having problems getting this image name, okay? So let's do this. Let's come over here and delete the deployment. And by the way, here's a way to delete. Instead of deleting the deployment, you can just use the, uh, the YAML file. Okay, this is actually considered to be a better form to delete using the YAML file, just like I created it using the YAML file. Uh, that way it, you know exactly the name. I could have also said get deployments, figured out its name and then cube control delete deployment and its name, whatever it was, okay. But now let's try this. Let's try, I wanna show you this. This is a really important one because you will get burned on this one. Uh, Sarah, see where it says V6, Quayio Burr Center My Boot V6. Let's go over here. Okay. Uh, I gotta bring my Firefox up. And I know, I know you think I'm trying to log into Red Hat, I'm not. Let's go to Quayio My Boot images see that v6 right there i just created it uh five days ago okay if and there's a v7 there's a five four three two one right so uh let's actually say i put v8 here and there is no v8 there's no v8 image so i hit save i say cube control apply dash f well actually let me just go up here and do it okay look what watch what happens cube ctl get events all right, first of all, you see the er, er image pool because it can't really find that image, okay? That image doesn't really exist. And if we dig around in here, we will see that it can't, it, it, it doesn't exist. Uh, so where's the pulling? And one problem, by the way, is this thing is not ordered. Your events, by the way. Uh, so get events sorted. Let's do an ordered, okay? I have a script for that. It's also in the document, how to get them ordered. But see right here, it failed to pull the image V8. There ain't no V8. So therefore it can't get it. And now it's doing this image pull back off. This is a very common error for you guys to get, all right? Because you'll just typo the image name 
Okay, and you won't quite be able to make it work. Now I can go edit that document and I should, by the way, I can go edit that document and fix my problem, check that back into source control. But again, the declarative nature of Kubernetes is so powerful. Uh, let's see here, uh, Kube control get deployments. If I have to fix this, even in my production runtime environment, kubectl edit, you should never do this by the way, uh, deployments, my boot. I can come here into the production environment uh, figure out where that image is. Uh, da, 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 da. Where is it? There it is. And make it something that I know exists. So there we go. And six. Okay. And the now and notice it goes to running. So that image it has. Now it's up and happy. Again, I can cube control exec it dash dash bin bash and curl local host 8080. There we go. All right. So there it is. Now your, one of your questions is going to be, well, how do the images come to be to begin with? How do they exist to begin with? We cover that a little bit later. Okay. We cover that a little bit later. So here's what we ought to do next. Okay. We did this, we did this, right? All that's good. I think you, how many people got this far with it? You got through the cube control section. You got the pod and replica set section. How many people kind of got that working at least? Because you got to have those basics working before we can do the more advanced things with services and things like that, blue green deployments and you know, we building images down here in this section of, of our tutorial. Let's see, where's the chat at? Yeah, there it is. Do it all the time. Dun, dun, dun. All right. So yeah, just tell me if you guys are doing okay. So Mark. Mark Owens has said he's doing okay. And, and also what Kubernetes are you using? If you're not using Minikube, tell me what you're using. Are you using Kind, the Docker one, okay? The GKE from Google, AKS, EKS from Azure, Amazon. All right, Andrew working on Minikube, fantastic. All right, very good there. Okay. Let's do this. We've been going at it for about an hour and 48 minutes. Let's take, you guys want to take a few minute break. Let people go to the restroom real quick. Let people uh, grab some water. People who are fighting their way through making mini cube run can continue fighting with it right here. Okay. So let's see here. Uh, uh, countdown clock. Let me see. There's one Google has. Let's just do a five minute break. Let me see. We got an error here. Guest provision failed to validate network. So that is still on the mini cube. Guest provision. So that's telling me that mini cube can't speak to the virtual box on that machine. How does, let's see here. Okay, there was some debugging, not on this one. There are some debugging notes. Uh, let's see, here's your drivers. Let's see if this is the one. Uh, leave, yeah. Try looking at this uh, website. It gives you a little bit more information about the drivers from Minikube. And this is something we did a while ago. So this document is fairly dated. But there are also some, you know, debugging or setup steps here that might help you, depending on your, you know. So even though it's very dated at this point, it might help you figure out why your vert, why your virtualization solution is not working. Okay. All right. Well, let's get back into this. Uh, let me see. Let's go back here. Okay. All right. We kind of showed you pod, replica set, and deployment. These are all critical aspects, again, to get your head around because this is how the magic happens. Also, you're hopefully getting a feel for what you've seen so far that Kubernetes is a declarative state, an eventual consistency kind of operation. So in other words, we declare what we want, like we declare we want a replica set, and it goes about making it happen in the world, right? In this case, inside those worker nodes. And this, in the case of Minikube, it's all in one, right? It's a master node and worker node all in one, okay? So just be aware of that. 
that you know it's a declarative thing. You're updating the database, and then in turn, it's going out there and trying to make it happen. And the reason that matters is when you get more advanced with Kubernetes, you can basically add your own object types to the Kubernetes API. Okay, so we'll talk more about that as we get a little bit later, uh, but maybe make it a little bit more real for you. Okay, if I come over here and say kube control get CRDs on my on my big old cluster over here, I have a, a Kafka CRD. So therefore I can deploy whole Kafka objects now. And that means a whole Kafka broker, which is three broker processes, three zookeepers, and, and uh, an operator around it as an example. Uh, if one of the things we see in the tutorial, uh, the example I came up with a long time ago was pizzas. So if I come over here, we can declare pizzas, okay? We can have pizza objects inside our Kubernetes. So in other words, you can make Burr objects, James objects, Brandon objects, it doesn't really matter. And the cool thing about that is you can then write your own custom controller, okay? We call this an operator, by the way, uh, to then respond to new pizzas, respond to new Burrs, new Brandons, new James. And there's a, oh, yes, that's James. We have James Ward here also. Okay, so you can have a James Ward object type if you want uh, inside your Kubernetes cluster. Okay, let's get into the service concept a little bit more. Let me see, what have I destroyed here so far? Let, what do we got running so far? Uh, that's not that here. Uh, let's see, kubectl get all. Oh, wait, I'm in the wrong cluster. I'll come back over to this cluster. kubectl get all. Let's see what we got running. Okay, we left Lester, we left our hero in this boat. We have the deployment, we have our service, we have our pod. Okay, fine, that's all good. Then we basically showed you all that. Now we create a service, okay? Now here's the trick with the service. Notice this selector, app, Quarkus demo. You see that right there? That is a piece of the magic. So you kind of have to know about the selector. So if I say get pods dash dash show labels, I'm not sure if this is even the right thing here. All right, see it says app my boot. So if I basically deploy the service, it's gonna look for app uh, Quarkus demo, not app my boot. So the service can't map to the pod that exists because I've deployed the wrong pod. Okay, so let me uh, do this, uh, get deployments and kubectl delete deployment, my boot. All right, we're gonna get rid of the deployment which gets rid of the replica set, which gets rid of the pods. All righty there, all right. So all that gets cleaned up nicely, okay? And StremZ, that StremZ is the Kafka as an example. So yes, uh, so that's good information to have. You want the StremZ if you wanna actually run Kafka on your Kubernetes cluster. All right, so let me back up here and make sure I do this, what we said to do here. All right, so we're gonna have the MySpace cube in S, where am I at? Okay, so let's create Let's create the space by space, create CTO, create namespace, namespace, my space. I'll just use the shortcut, create uh, Kubernetes, my space. There we are, we're in the right namespace now. Um, I don't have this deployment anymore. Quark is demo deployment. That's because it was over here. Let me go find it real quick. Let's get it running. All right, that, not the replica set, we want the deployment. There we go. Quarkus uh, demo deployment. Yep, that looks right. Run it. Okay. Now notice right away, there's something different about the deployment we haven't really explained yet. Uh, get pods. Show labels. All right, see so it says app Quarkus demo here. ENV dev. ENV dev app Quarkus demo. That came from right here. In the template area, we basically say, go ahead and apply these labels to the pods that are created. So we're gonna create pods from this image. We're gonna always pull this image, by the way, always is just for development purposes, never use it in production because it's slow. Uh, you know, you typically wanna cache these images on your production nodes, but in this case, I just say always for making it more fun from a development standpoint. Uh, the name of those, you know, the pod name, by the way, will be based on the name you see here, but notice these labels get applied. ENV dev Quarkus demo. And if I come back and look here and sh I say show labels, you can see app Quarkus demo, ENV dev. So when we create our service, we want those labels to match. That's the key element of the service here. So if I copy and paste a service into place, 
It says at Quarkus demo. That's what it's looking for. It doesn't care about the dev, env dev. It just cares about the uh, cube. Let's cube get services. Okay, there's that service. Okay, there it is. Watch this cube CTL get endpoints. Notice there's three endpoints for that service. There's a three, so 172.17.3, 172.17.4, 172.17.5. Okay, where do these endpoints come from? If I come say uh, describe service, the service, well, right there, there's the endpoints. And there they are. Where do those numbers come from? Cube CTL get pods O wide. And there are those numbers. So there's my pod IP address. And that pod IP address shows up as an endpoint in my service. Now, this is where it gets a little bit tricky. Okay. And you'll see this a little bit in a little bit later. The, because the reason it shows up here is because the labels match. All right. The labels match. The selector right here. See where it says selector. Where to go? Da, 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 da. Oh boy. Let's show the selector here properly. Kubectl get services. Kubectl get service. The service. Oh, YAML. Let's see. Type in selector right there. Okay, so I'm looking at it. So selector right there. Because of the selector, that's what it, it knows to find the pods, get their IP address, load into its uh, uh, endpoints. All right, so get endpoints is where you'll see it. And that is how the magic happens. That's how the load balancer works. So it works across those three pods named by these IP addresses be simply because their labels match. That's all, all right? The magic of labels. If the labels didn't match, it wouldn't show up, okay? So let's see here, kubectl uh, label. Let's try to label this. I wonder if I can, uh, yeah, let me try to hack a label right here. So app minus, I'm trying to remove the label from one pod, the one right there in the middle. Let's see if I was successful. Oh, and here's what's funny. Because I have the deployment, I did I did remove it from the one, but then it realized, oh, we need to, the deployment's like, let me create a new one for you. So like it's a little, it's outsmarting me here. But if we kind of watch it closely, kubectl get endpoints, Endpoints, get endpoints. Boy, I can't type today. All right. See, it's uh, three, five, and six now when it used to be three, four, and five. So basically, the one without the label got dropped out. Okay. And the fact that, you know, the deployment is trying to create the world that we asked for, it basically spawned another one for me. Okay, so that's really what we're trying to show you here in the section on services is this concept that you get this load balancer for free. And then of course you can then interact with it. Like if I use my mini cube set up here, I can say curl da, 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 port, there we go. And I can say while true do and this curl command, I can loop along. There we go and pause for just a little bit and then done. And there we go, we're bouncing off those guys, okay? And again, as I manipulate those pods in some way or another, removing labels, adding labels, and they will drop in and out of the service automatically and you'll just see it just keep on trucking, okay? That's really what it's there for. Now, there we have a section here on ingress. Ingress is also in the advanced section. So we're gonna skip it for now because ingress is a little bit tricky and it depends on your cluster vendor. So you, in the case of Minikube, which we've documented here, this is how you set up ingress for Minikube. But depending on if you're Google or IBM or Amazon or OpenShift or whomever you're getting your Kubernetes cluster from, Ingress is unique per cluster, all right? You can even tell that right here with the host name. It has got GCP Burr Sutter Dev in there. Obviously, I had made it just for me, for my Google environment at that time uh, when burrsutter.dev was my host name or my domain name, I should say. And so, you know, even the Ingress file itself is not, you, it's cannot, it won't be common, if you will, right? It's going to be unique. And so uh, the good news is every Kubernetes cluster worth a damn does have Ingress support. You just have to make sure it's turned on and configured correctly. And it, again, it's unique per cluster. So if you come to the Ingress section under advanced down here, you'll see how to do it for Minikube. And then this will work for you. For now, I'm just going to ignore it, okay? Because on Minikube, it doesn't really offer a lot of value. In the case of OpenShift, all right, when you're dealing with OpenShift, it actually is this thing called a route. 
and the route is HA proxy based. By the way, this ingress down here is uh, Nginx based. In the case of OpenShift, we use HA proxy for our ingress. Okay, so you can kind of go play with that if you like. There is a logs command. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because there's more interesting things to go show you. But there is a logs command where you basically say cube control and logs and the name of the pod in question. And so to kind of show you what that is, let's, uh, so that's bebopping along there. So I'm going to copy that pod identifier right there, cube control logs. And so I can see there's the logs for that one application. There's not much interesting from a logging standpoint, but there, that's how you pick the logs from a certain pod. There's a tip I'll give you, which is dash P. If for some reason the, the pod is failing, dash P will give you the previous failing pods logs if it can. Uh, that's one way to get it. Uh, this is logs, by the way, for a developer. This is not production logging. This is just for a developer. Uh, but there's another option called Stern, and Stern allows for wildcard matches. So I can say Quarkus demo, and it will match all the Quarkus demo pods and give me a little color coding here to basically give me, I can see the unique differences per pod now based on the color coding. So Stern does a wildcard match, and also Stern follows. So you can follow with the regular logging command, but seeing Stern is, is uh, going to stream out the logs. So Stern's a very powerful tool for your uh, debugging purposes when it comes to learning how to use Kubernetes. Uh, and it works on Minikube, it works on your Kubernetes cluster. Okay, so Stern is a good tip for you there. Okay, another debugging tip is to exec into the pod. You've seen me do that several times. So exec into the pod, think of that like as an SSH into the pod in question that allows you to go check it out and see if it's behaving correctly, misbehaving. So your exec command, by the way, is into that Linux container and it's gonna be limited by the Linux container. So depending on how you built that image, we'll talk more about images in a second, it may or may not even have been bash, okay? Like there's some container images I have that only have SH. So it's not a bash shell, it's just a regular, uh, whatever it's called, C shell or something. I forget what SH is called. Maybe someone on chat knows. What is the default shell if you forget to set it, right? So if it may not have a bash shell. It may not have tools like PS or top, uh, but like, let's see this, let's see what this image looks like. I don't know, I've forgotten at this point. QCTL exec, IT, dash dash, bin bash. Okay, so I'm inside it now. So PS, PS dash EF. Uh, so there's no PS, there's no top. Uh, let's see, cat, Etsy, OS release. So we have a bash shell, but we don't have much of the tools that you would expect inside it. All right, so like PS, top, uh, let's see, is DF here. Okay, so I can use DF to see exactly what I have. So just keep that in mind that you might, you know, depending on the base image you've used, uh, you may or may not have the things you want. So born shell is the default shell if you don't have bash shell. Thank you for that, Jason. Uh, so he responded to me there on the chat. The, um, so just keep that in mind. So the exec tool is your, your favorite tool. You might do a Java dash version. What version of Java do I have here? Oh, do I even have a Java here? Oh, and I actually don't. You know why? Because this Quarkus application is compiled to native and doesn't need a Java runtime. That's funny. I, I hadn't thought about it. So if I was using my Spring Boot image, because it needs a Java runtime, you would actually be able to type Java, Java C, things like that. Okay. And then exit from that shell back into my Mac shell in this case. All right. So a lot of just debugging tips there when it comes to log, exec, et cetera. Standard stuff you've seen before. There's also another tool called Kale. Do check out Kale as another option. All right. Let me show you this thing we call service magic. All right. And the reason I'm going to show it to you is because hopefully this will help you get your head in the game when it comes to these services. QCTL get deployments. All right. Let's wipe this one out. Actually, let's delete the whole namespace. Let's wipe out the whole thing. Uh, this was called my stuff, right? Let me double check. QCTL get namespaces. Sometimes it's just easier to wipe out the whole namespace and everything inside it. Uh, my stuff. Oh, my space. My space. Alrighty. Yeah, get rid of that. You'll notice it takes a little while for the delete to return on a namespace because it is going to go out there and try to rip everything down. So it takes time and it basically wants to nicely clean everything up and then respond back to you. So you are blocked while that thing is occurring. I'm going to let it be blocked. I'm going to say, I'm going to go ahead and do this thing now. Let's go ahead and go to the fun stuff namespace. All right. And again, you can set context using this command or use the kubins command, kubins, 
fun stuff. All right. All right, that's not the way to do it. So get all in fun stuff. There's nothing in fun stuff so far. Let's go put some stuff in here. Let's go put some stuff in the fun stuff one. All right, let's deploy this Python app. Let's deploy this my Go app. So a Python app, a Go app, and a Node.js app. All right, so just three completely different things, seemingly speaking. Uh, and you kind of see right there, see it says app my Go, app my Node, app my Python. It's doing container creating. That's because it is pulling. If I say get events, we should see some pullings and pullings. And then eventually we'll see pulled. So it's pulling that image. Again, smaller images come down faster. And by the way, this pulling happens on every worker node that the, the container runs on. So if you have six worker nodes in your cluster and you're constantly changing that app, right? It's got to pull the image to all six nodes. There are various tools to help you pre-pull the images if you're really worried about that. Uh, and uh, but otherwise you have to wait for the pulling per worker node. Okay, uh, just keep that in mind. All right, looks like we got a couple of them running here. The my node is taking some time. I think that is a big one, the my node one. Okay, all right, so that's good. Now let's create our service. Notice the service selector says at my stuff. Okay, and in service my pods, in service my pods. So it's looking for in service my pods. Let's go and run that service. And let's see, we got, there's no, there's not gonna be any endpoints. Uh, see, it says none. Describe my service, my service. All right, see endpoints, none. Okay, because none, so far for the selector, the selector says, uh, where to go? Uh, Man, they, they, every now and then they kind of move things around. I get confused. So let's do this. All right, service and get. So not in the describe, it's in the get. And oh, YAML, there we go. The selector in service my pod, you see that? That's, that's basically, there's no pod matching that label. Okay, so let's go ahead and run our little looper here. And let's do that, all right. I'm just, I'm just copying and pasting for the sake of going fast. Okay, and we're getting all these errors because there are no pods backing up that service. All right, no pods backing up the service. So how do we add a pod to it? So all we gotta do is label a pod. We're gonna label the MyPython pod with this additional label called in-service MyPods. So watch what happens when we add the label. Immediately we start getting responses from the Python pod. And you can see here is the new label. It says app my Python in service my pods. If I remove that label and you do it by just putting the minus sign here. All right, it's gone. So our users are getting errors again. If I add it back, we get Python. But this what, what this means is if you're paying attention, this is kind of how you could do some interesting blue green style deployments, right? With a, a, a regular old Kubernetes. Simply by labeling your pods correctly, they show up in the service or not. And so if I do kubectl get endpoints, we see we have one there, which is 172.17.03. That should be the IP address that maps to that pod right there. If I say kubectl get pods o wide, you'll see that is the 117.03. That is in fact it. Okay, and it has the label. That's how we know. But if I subtract that label, remove it, it's gone. If I say kubectl get endpoints, all right, we're back to none endpoints again. So that is a bit of the magic. Okay, so let me the, let me do the Python. Let me do the Go. Let me do the Node. Let's add them all in. So even though these Im are implemented using different technology, it doesn't matter. As long as they have the same basic API, in this case, it's doing a get request. That's what curl is doing, a get request, HTTP get against the root on that system. As long as that works, we're good to go, okay? You can see now it's load balancing across the Python, the Node.js, the Go. It's kind of all random at this point because of the way we did it, but it is working as we expect it to. If I say kubectl get endpoints, Right, you see that is the magic of the service right there. And if I come back and remove one of these guys, let's remove go, oh, remove go, ah, type the minus sign burr. Go is gonna drop out and it's just Python and node. And if I come over here and minus out the Python, 
it's going to just be node kubectl get endpoints. All right. So I want you guys to be aware of that because that's an incredibly powerful construct. And because of that construct, it's one of the most powerful aspects of Kubernetes, right? That concept of being able to just simply map your services on the fly. Your end users deal with the service and the pods are ephemeral. The pod IP address is ephemeral. That's why you don't really worry about the pod IP addresses. That's why it's kind of hidden over here under the O wide command. So here you see the actual uh, pod IP and you actually see the node it's running on. That's your worker node. In the case of Minikube, it's all one and the same. If I come over here to my big old cluster, QCDL get pods, uh, let's do all namespaces, O wide, right? This is gonna be a big mess of stuff, but you will see, you know, it'll basically show you this is the node that it's on, the IP address, IP address for that pod, the node that it's on. And you can see I have a bunch of different nodes here on this big old cluster, QCTL get nodes running on my Google environment. So James Ward there, you, you like the fact that I'm running on the Google environment? As an example, if he's still with us, let's see if he's still with us. Okay, there we go. So that that's what we call service magic. So that little exercise kind of helps you do some pretty fun stuff when it comes to working with, the, uh, working with this environment. Okay, there's also blue green deployments, which it's very similar. So you can kind of check that out or you should check it out uh, because it's very similar in what you can do but you can kind of see how you can fall, fail over from blue to green, right? With the, I can go to Python version, the Go version, the Node.js version, all that pretty quickly. Okay, that is what the blue green concept is all about, right? The ability to kind of fail over between the two. And notice we're using a patch command here. So Q control patch, and we're patching the, uh, the service, right? We're actually patching it. So you could edit it, you could redeploy the YAML, or you could just patch the one live in production and watch the bits flip back and forth. It's pretty awesome, okay? So there's the patch command there too. Very powerful concept. Okay, so let me, yeah, let's go here. Wait, I wanna get you to the next section, okay? Next section here. kubectl get namespaces, kubectl delete uh, namespace. Fun stuff, let's just get rid of that one. And that we'll, we'll see those pods go away up here. Okay, it's going to re remove its deployment, remove the replica sets, then eventually tear down the pods. Keep in mind, the pod is really what's running your code, right? So the pod is the, the container uh, the, of your application. All right, there it goes. It's going away now. So let's talk about building images. All right, we've been so far, we've done everything with using existing images. And the building images part is pretty important. Okay, so let's kind of do this from scratch. All right, from not complete scratch, we'll just take an existing one. I have a hello world. Let's go into the Spring Boot hello world. Okay, let me bring up my Visual Studio code here. Let's see, where's the Java code for it? Here we go. It says howdy right now. Let's actually make this uh, namaste. Okay, yeah, 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 VS code, go away. All right, so I made the greeting namaste. Okay, so I'm gonna save that. I'm going to close that. Don't save that. All right. So I'm just making a piece of a Java code change. There's a lot of things this thing is doing. Like it's actually asking the JVM for its resources. This becomes important, by the way, because Java will blow up on a, in a containerized world in a C groups world if you don't treat it carefully and have the right version of Java. So this actually demonstrates how to blow up a, a Java, which is kind of fun. And for anybody here who's really a Node.js and anti-Java person, this is your moment to gloat on watching Java die or Python, right, uh, Go, et cetera, because it's fairly easy to do it if you know the trick to it. And it actually happens in a lot of production runtime environments. A lot of Red Hat customers are blowing up their JVMs. And so we show you how to do it so you can figure out how to work around it in the future. In any case, let's say we do our Maven uh, clean compile package. So basically I've made a change to the code. I'm gonna compile the code here on my local machine. That gives us this fat jar right here so right there, so if I say Java dash jar target and then boot demo jar, this is gonna run it on my local machine. And we'll wait for a second for Spring Boot to come up. Okay, it's up, curl localhost 8080. Now this is localhost on my Mac and it says namaste from Spring Boot, okay? So that is your, you know, let's say that's your code. That's the code you want in production. So the next step is to build a Docker image. Now here's the part that's tricky. 
there's a hundred different ways to build a Docker image. I'm going to show you the most basic way to build a Docker image. Okay. The most basic way. And that is you have to have this Docker file. Okay. And the Docker file is going to have a from command in it. It's going to be from some base image. If you don't specify the repository name, think of it as Docker IO by default. Okay. So everything is Docker IO by default, which basically means Docker hub. So if I come over here to Docker hub, that's where that image is going to come from. I could pull it from Quay.io. I could pull it from GCRIO. I could pull it from some other place and I don't need to sign in. Uh, let's see here. Let's come back here and then let's go get open JDK. All right, the open JDK. Okay, and you can say there's been 500 million pulls of this image and tags. You can see there's lots of tags and I'm using tags 8U151. Let's actually just search for it here. Okay, there it is. So there's the, the tag for it. Okay, last updated two years ago. And actually, I'm not using these Alpine ones. Uh, it's not the slim, slim. You can see there's all these different options. There it is. I'm using that one from three years ago. All right. Now, this is important that you understand this. You need to know where your container images are coming from because depending on where you're getting this base image from, someone could have snuck in a nice little Bitcoin miner in that image or whatever backdoor that they might want because it is a Linux image and therefore anything that Linux can do, this can do. So if they wanna have some stuff hidden in there, they can. So you do wanna make sure that you've double checked where you're getting your images from. Is it good? Is it, you know, are any backdoors in there? Are there violations in that image? Uh, for instance, if you go to Quay.io, uh, one of the things we have, and Quay.io, by the way, is a Red Hat service. Uh, let's see, let's see, well, let me search here. I don't know, I haven't looked, I haven't looked at this thing in so long. Um, yeah, I'm just picking on something random but it'll actually give you a, a security scan. In this case, you can see it's all past here. If you look at some of my images, I got all kinds of security vulnerabilities in mind because I haven't updated them. So just be careful of where you get your base image from, all right? That's kind of the point here. And so once you have that base image identified, and by the way, this is not a good one. The one I picked here is not a good one. I just picked it because it's kind of fun to show you, 8U151. You got to have your from, then you basically set up your work directory. You copy in what you want. In this case, it's going to go get the boot demo 1.0.0.jar. Uh, let me double check. That is, in fact, the one uh, LS, LS target. All right. Yep, that's the one. That's the one. We're going to pick it up off our hard drive. We're going to drop it into this container image. We're going to expose 8080. And then when we go to run it at runtime, it's going to run Java, Java options, which I didn't specify any, dash jar, jar name. So in other words, at runtime, it's going to do exactly what you saw here, except there's not going to be a target director anymore. It's going to do exactly that. Okay, This is like bare bones, super easy Java. You would have node there if it was your node uh, or npm start, if it's your node application or your Python app. Right? It all depends on how you configure that image but you would just run your app, okay? So you gotta have a Docker file. Once you have your Docker file, oh, let me look at this real quick, uh, Docker. Yeah, this is the one that's mapped to my Minikube. Let's not map the one, let's ignore the one that's mapped to Minikube, only because I don't wanna confuse folks or confuse myself. <laughs> All right, so yeah, so there's no Docker host here. If there's no Docker host set, it defaults to the Docker daemon. Uh, for Docker Desktop on Mac and Windows. Okay, so let's go here. Apps, uh, Hello World, Spring Boot. So you're going to do Docker build dash T, and I'm going to go ahead and put in the repository name because I know I'm going to push it there. This is just a little shortcut. My boot V8. I think I have, let's go double check. I don't have a V8 there. Let's see. My boot, no, there's a seven, there's a six, there's no V8. Let's do a V8 here. And then dot. Dot is where to pick up the files to be loaded into my image. So dot says in the current directory I'm sitting in, that's where its Docker file is. All right, so it built that image real fast. It builds real fast, by the way, if you've built it before and, and some of the image layers are already cached. I could do a Docker run to double check it real quick. I'm going to trust that it's okay. Uh, I should do a Docker run, but I'm going to cheat. Quay.io, uh, burr setter. And then we're going to go to my boot v8. So what we're doing is we're pushing it from the local Docker daemon out across the internet to the Quay.io repository. 
I've already done my Docker login, by the way, and Docker login is how you log in. So it knows that this is Burr uh, from my machine. So I've already authenticated. And if I come over here and refresh now, we should see there's a recent V8. Yeah, a few seconds ago, V8 was added. So there it is. And now I can just use it. Okay. And by the way, anybody here on this call right now could use it also. So you could do a Docker run with those same coordinates and run it. So let's actually try that repair. So Docker run dash IT dash P 8080. I think I'm doing this right. It's been so long because uh, I don't use Docker as much as I used to because there's all these other ways to do this. Okay. So Quay IO for setter my boot V8. I think I did that right. Let's see here. Okay. Yeah, it looks okay. Curl localhost 8080. There we go. Namaste, Spring Boot. That's my V8 one right there. Okay, and let me hit control C. So I did the Docker run. You guys could do the same Docker run on your machine to pull my image and run it on run it there. Okay. And so the, the dash P8080 says map the internal 8080 to my to my local host 8080. By the way, I'll post this into the chat. Okay, so you guys can have it. And that basically allows me to run. Uh, that Docker image. Okay. Now, now that you have your Docker image, you just got to make it run on your Kubernetes. You remember there's that create deployment command. So we had that create deployment command. So you could do that. Okay. But that create deployment command is just for real time kind of hacking, right? Real time kind of hacking. So that's what you would use it for. Oh, by the way, I, I we have the user go through sys resources. So you'll see how it reports its resources. And actually, let's go and show you that because that could be an important an important element. Okay, let me show you this because it misreports its resources. And if anybody has to manage these things in production, you will run into this issue. Uh, Docker run. Oh, come on. I thought I had the Docker run here. Where'd it go? Docker run. Let's do it again. Uh, let's say dash dash rm. Yeah, rm it p. The RM base says delete it when I'm done with it. So after I close it, it auto deletes it. Okay. Uh, Burr setter, my boot, V8. Come on now. There it is, loading up again. This, by the way, is all happening in the context of my Docker daemon. It is not running in my mini cube at this point. Okay. But there it is. If I say sys resources, look where it basically says it's got 1.2 gigabytes of RAM and three cores. Now, where does this information come from? Okay, why does the JVM on that little Spring Boot application think it has access to three cores and 1.2 gigabytes of RAM? It comes from what you see in the VirtualBox settings. All right, so right here, I basically said, give it three cores and eight gigs of RAM. So there's the three cores, that's pretty obvious. It's basically saying the JVM has access to all cores on the node, the node in this case being DevNation, and all memory on the node, in this case, the, the um, memory being this eight gigabytes I've assigned to it. And based on the heap size it calculates, it's about a, it's less than a quarter, about a quarter of that total memory. So basically it takes total memory and gives you about a quarter for heap, okay? This does mean that if you are using a constrained environment, using C groups to constrain that environment, it will over allocate memory and blow up. All right, so let's kind of show you what that looks like. Uh, and we can do it here all from the Docker daemon. Okay, let's see here. See, by the way, there's, it's, uh, if you're using, oh, I'm sorry. I told you the wrong thing. I gave you the Minikube information, which is, works the same way. But in this case, I am running against the Docker daemon. Uh, it reminded me here, and I, I think I wrote this documentation long ago. I can't remember my own steps. But come here, Docker engine, uh, resources. All right, so yes, so this is the three cores. It's funny, I had this practice number three cores, and it's actually a quarter of that 575, okay? So that's actually where the number's coming from. Uh, let me not confuse myself. Okay, so if you use consume there, okay, it will consume it. But it, let's do this. Let's constrain our resources here. We're going to constrain our resources to 400, meg, uh, 400 uh, megabytes and one CPU. Let's do that. Okay, let's do that. Uh, do, 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 do. Control C. There we go. Let's add in this additional set of constraints. 
There we go. And come on now. Sys resources. Okay, so it still says to 1268 megabytes RAM or gigabytes in this case, and three cores. And if I say consume, and all consume does, by the way, is have an immutable string that is trying to concatenate up to what it thinks memory should be. And let's see what happens here. It seems like it's hung up. But what it's trying to do, it's asking the JVM to allocate that memory that it thinks it has access to. And if you do this, and depending on the environment you're doing it in, it will kill it, all right? Because it's trying to go beyond the memory constraint specified. So in this case, it does say killed here. So in the Docker daemon, it got killed. If you do this on Kubernetes, it also gets killed, okay? So just be aware of it. That's an important thing to understand because it, in Kubernetes, you almost always have these constraints and the JVM will over allocate, okay? The way you fix that is there's other Docker files that are here that you should check out in this little sample app, okay? One is just use Java 11. Java 11 doesn't have the problem, okay? Also, 151 has the problem, but if you go a little bit later, like 200 something, it doesn't have the problem, all right? That's another item. And if you basically come up here and say, okay, unlock experimental options. So if you wanna use 151, unlock experimental options, will also uh, fix the memory portion. It doesn't fix the CPUs, but you don't get killed for overusing your CPUs. You just don't really have access to your CPUs, okay? You just can't use them. But if you try to over allocate memory, it will sh shut you down. So unlock experimental options will fix the memory issue. All right, use C group memory limit for heap. And then the other option right here is to simply uh, fix it. So in other words, make your heap size a certain size and then you can't over allocate it. In this case, you might still blow the memory, uh, but it's gonna be much harder to blow the memory because you fixed your heap size to something to be very small. The reason I put it down as 112 megabytes here is because back on our command line, it was 400 megs. So I was trying to keep that about 25% factor for heap. Okay, so you know, 25% of 400 is about 112 megs of RAM. Okay, that's kind of the idea there. So you can use these different Docker files and then that of course would build your image in a more appropriate way. Okay, so that's how to build your image. Now, if I go over here to my nine steps class, I, some other options available to you that you should be aware of when it comes to building images, where's it at? Tools, and blah, 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 there's all this stuff. Uh, building images, right? So we use the Docker build, which is the default typical thing, right? Docker build. However, there's this JCube, which can be input, put in your Maven Palm XML. There's JIB that comes from the Google team, okay? That also would be very valuable to you. JIB will also build your image, push your image for you automatically. There's tools like S2I, right? S2I is built into things like OpenShift. Uh, like where, let me see. Yeah, like, so here's an example. If I come over here to developer, and I hit add from Git. So if I basically say, I want to add the project GitHub for, okay, I'm just gonna pick up one of my projects that I've been playing with lately and that's the Spring Pet Clinic. So I'm gonna just paste that Git repo. So if you'll notice, there's no Docker file in here. There's a Docker compose, but it's different. There's no Docker file, there's no YAMLs, Right, so if you paste that in uh, and we say we want it to be a Java app and we'll give it the app, 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 that looks good. Deployment, so the deployment object we see there too. And let's hit create, okay. It's gonna go through the process of building that image and deploying it. So this is a YAML-less, docker file solution to basically running your app in a Kubernetes cluster. In this case, it's a, a feature specific of OpenShift, but that's what S2I represents, right? It basically takes your source and makes your image out of it with no Docker files, no YAML files, et cetera. There's other tools like in the case of Tekton. So if you remember, there's this class also called Tekton that we teach. And in that Tekton example, you can basically uh, build your image in cluster. So it's like S2I and S2I by the way, can be used with Tekton, but this is a full pipeline solution. So you can have a full uh, pipeline-based solution to do not only your get clone, your Maven build, your Maven test, your Maven package, your uh, produce the Docker image using Builda, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, do a load test, roll it from production one to production two. You know, it's a full pipeline solution and that's Tekton. 
there's also many other solutions, okay? So lots of things like build packs is another example. Lots of ways to build images. That's, we've had a lot, of, um, a lot of flexibility in this area, okay? A lot of things happening in this area. All right, let me see. We did that, we did that. Uh, we pushed the image. Uh, let's see here. Let's go here and try this, okay? Let's now talk about how to deploy that app into Kubernetes. But now we're going to we're going to constrain the resources, All right? So we did that my boot V8. That's the image I created, right? So let me come over here. Let's bring back this. This is my my boot deployment. The V8 was the one I just created. Okay, we just created it. So let's actually run this guy. All right, this deployment YAML here. Cube, Cubinus. Uh, Cubeness, kubectl, create namespace. Uh, all right, I'm just giving it a name, okay? There we go. My watch switched automatically for me. That's fantastic. So cube applied sf, uh, apps, cube files, my boot, deployment, YAML. This is the one that has the V8 in it. So let's that run. Okay, let's exec into it to make sure it's the right one. And bash, curl localhost, the namaste one, that's fantastic. That's the one that we wanted. Okay, all right, good. Okay, so that's the one we just ran right there, my boot deployment. And now what we want to do is constrain this thing, okay? So I'm going to go to this uh, one now, my boot deployment resources. And so to notice the difference between these two worlds, and actually let's do this. Uh, select for compare. Compare what's selected. So you'll see there's a slight difference between these two files. Uh, for one thing, my image name is different, so let me fix this up. So, all right, so there we get the V8. But notice before, the one we deployed before did not have the resources section, the request section. See that? So we're gonna do that. We're gonna basically make some requests. And actually, I'm going to mistype the CPU request here. Notice I put 10,000 M in, not 1,000. 1,000 M, 1,000 millicores is one core. 10,000 millicores is 10 cores. So let me save that file. Okay. And actually, let's go wipe out the previous deployment just to be on the safe side. Just to really make it hopefully super obvious what we're doing here. And let me do this. All right. Okay, so we're getting rid of that old deployment. Let's do this one, resources. So let's this one come to life and watch, look at what's happening here, pending. The reason it's pending is because there is not a worker node with 10 cores available. So the first thing to understand about resources, there's this request and a limit. We'll see the limit in a section, a sec second. Okay, request is please allocate some, you know, please find me a worker node with at least 300 megabytes of RAM and 10 cores in this case. We don't have 10 cores in any specific node. Remember, this is VirtualBox I'm using here, so I only gave it three cores all together. If I had made it 10 cores, it might have worked. Okay, uh, but there's not 10 available cores in any of our systems, so you're going to see pending. So pending is your, hmm, I'm out of resources. I'm out of memory or I'm out of cores. Primarily you're out of cores. And how do you know what to do with that information? You use get events. So when you do your get events, da, 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 right there, look for this one. Zero of one nodes are available, one insufficient CPU. Okay. Now, let me, um, while, let me while I'm doing this, let me come over here to this machine. Uh, what, what project was I working in earlier? Uh, my stuff over here. Okay, go see project, my stuff. I'm switching over to my Google cluster what, based on uh, based on OpenShift. Let's see what we have running out here. All right, there's the spring pet clinic, okay, up and running that we just did earlier. Uh, but ignore that one for now. I'm going to come to the same Kubernetes tutorial. I'm going to kubectl apply dash F. Let's see apps, cube files, and then the my boot deployment resources, the same thing as before.
And the reason I'm showing you this is even on a big cluster, all right, 10 is still gonna be a problem because my worker nodes do not have 10 cores. They're all like two or four core machines. Uh, so therefore there's not one with 10 cores. And so if I say kubectl get events, we will see, now let's see here. Dun, 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 dun. All right, let's try to do this, get events. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Maybe it just run here. Oh, okay. I have that in a different, whole another section. <laughs> this is actually kind of funny. Um, I'm in two different directories. I can confuse myself there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's copy that here. Get events sorted. Okay. Zero of six nodes available, six insufficient CPU. So even on this really big cluster, there's not one with 10 cores available. Okay. So just bear that in mind. And actually I should have been here and here instead. Uh, I, I use different directories for my big cl production clusters versus my mini cube environment. So the easiest thing to do is simply fix that problem. Let's see what my cube editor set here. Uh, editor. Yep. So kubectl get deployment and kubectl edit deployment. My boot. Let's try that Visual Studio Code. In this case, it's going across the internet to hit that cluster. And let me see, where is my image? V1, okay. Should have said it was V8 to begin with. And then where is the request 10 CPU? Let's request one CPU, save and close. With one CPU, we should see it get scheduled. So container creating, that means it's pull, oh, error image pull. Let me see, let me double check my image. Uh, Quay IO. Oh, that's because, yes, I put this in mine, not Red Developers One. Save. All right, let's see. Now we get, we should have a proper image name. It should pull that image. It will take a little time to pull the image across the internet to that cluster. Uh, so you'll, by the way, you'll, you'll see these eventually just go away, these other bad guys here. All right, and I can just delete them to get rid of them. Try to get rid of those things we don't need, but it's going to be pulling that image from Quayo. And dun, dun, dun. yep, yep, that should, there we go, and running. So let's see here. It is running now because it's no longer requesting 10 CPUs. Let me exec into it. Okay, there we go. Namaste. All right. I can now say uh, cube CTL. Oh, let's let it be. All right. Let's just let it. Yeah. All right. But the whole point of that was to basically show you how resources work. Huh. Okay. Now, in the case of resources, you have a request and you have a limits. Okay. Let's come down here to where the limits are. The limits are hard limits, and you should just be aware of them because you're going to get burned by this, okay? You're going to get burned by the hard limits. So resource limits. So there's a separate file for this one. Let me go look at it real quick. All right, let's close that and not that one. Let's go here. And this is the one with limits. So let me also make this one working off the right image again. Burr setter, my boot v8, okay. But notice this one basically has the request of 300 megs one quarter core, but a hard limit of 400 megs and one core. Now this is a hard limit. This is a C groups level limit, Linux kernel level limit. If you try to, if you try to blow it, uh, it will constrain you. If you try to blow the CPUs, it'll just constrain you and you won't get them. In the case of the memory, you will get shot in the head with an OOM killed, out of memory killed. Okay, so that's, that's that one right there. Let me go and try to run it. Okay, let's just go back to my mini cube here. And let's see, so that one get, get deployments. Okay, let's just try to overlay it. Replace, there's a replace command. And let's see, let's just replace it. My boot, uh, deployment, resources, limits, YAML. Okay. 
So we sh it should give up on that other one. Okay, there it looks like it's running. Cube CTL get services. I don't think I have a service here. Okay, good, right? Uh, Cube CTL exec IT. Let's get in there. Uh, well, I did something wrong. One dash. The double dash, single dash always confuses me. Uh, Localhost, 8080. This should be our namaste. Yeah, it's our namaste. Okay. Sys resources. How many resources do you think you have? All right. It thinks it has 1.7 gigabytes of RAM, three cores. This one is running on the mini cube. So this is what's coming from here. All right. So about a quarter of that eight gigabytes and three, uh, three CPUs. However, we did constrain it. And QCTL uh, edit deployment, my boot. Let's go check this out. Linux. Not that. There we go. So there are real constraints here. There's the limit and the re and the request. Okay. So request is can I be scheduled? The limit is a hard limit. So 400 megs of RAM, even though so it, it's constrained to 400 meg, even though it thinks it has 1.7 gig. All right. So if we call the consume. Okay. Notice we can empty reply. OOM killed. Restarts one. If you were paying attention and it goes real fast, it did OOM killed restarts one. So your restarts one is already a giveaway that something is not quite right. Okay. Something is not quite right. That pod was restarted when it tried to go over its memory limit. It got shot in the head by, by Linux. And then of course it got restarted. So Kubernetes is constantly self-healing. It is trying to create the world you've asked it to create. So it's trying to heal itself and it did. But the problem is, uh, you know, you might not even notice that it failed. Your users might notice it failed. The user got an error, right? Empty reply from server. But if we come over here now and say kubectl get events and we look in our event log, we should see, and again, uh, you know, stopping, killing. We might, we'll see some errors in here, but here's, it's more interesting. Uh, describe the pod. Let's go describe the pod. And there's the limits. And there it is. The last state was terminated due to OOM killed. That's how you know it got shot. Okay. And again, if you build your image correctly, the JVM doesn't over allocate memory, in which case you don't have this problem. But that's a fun way to see the resources and limits in real time and what it can do. And those are real constraints. Okay. And dun, dun, dun. And you will, you will get an error uh, from it, all right? You will get an error. Your user will get an error if they're trying to in invoke it. So that's really what the whole resource limits and up, um, ups is about, uh, resources limits is about. So let me pause for a second. Any questions about that? Any thoughts about that based on what you guys are seeing right now? Do you think that makes sense? Do you think that's kind of strange? A lot of people, when they see this the first time, they think it's kind of strange. Why is it getting killed? And of course it gets killed and it restarts automatically. So did it really get killed? And so one of the things you'll want to do if you're an operations person is you want to be looking for OOM killed in your log files and then I'm trying to understand better why it was killed. Uh, because since Kubernetes restarts everything and it actually works out pretty well. I've actually had one person tell me, a, a software manager who managed a lot of software developers, tell me they love this automatic restart thing that they saw here because their programmers write bad code, the programmers over allocate memory they shouldn't have, and therefore it gets restarted automatically, cleaning up the bad memory and starting from a clean slate. Because how many times have you guys gone into a production environment and told the person to reboot the machine? And for some reason it works fine after a reboot. And as a matter of fact, I had to reboot this laptop before I started today's session because some things just weren't run, wouldn't run on this computer any longer. So that's a reboot built in. The reason I'm making a point of this reboot concept is the next section is about how to do automated reboots. In other words, Kubernetes has a reboot feature built right in. This might really be worth the price of admission all by itself is the auto restart, auto reboot. Uh, again, the software development managers, like I have really bad programmers. So the auto reboot, auto restart is a wonderful thing because I have poor programmers as an example. So instead of my ops people having to restart reboot, eh, Kubernetes will do it for me. Okay. Let's see here. We did this rolling update idea before, but if you remember, we did it without the, um, 
we did it without the uh, the resources set correctly. So we were getting those error messages. So if you remember, we we're getting errors when we do the rolling update. Now let's do the rolling update with the appropriate appropriate resource constraints. Now, actually, this is going to just show the error again. So let's see that error. Okay, and there's no service. What deployments do I have here? Let's just get rid of that deployment. Okay. Uh, delete deployments, my boot. Uh, bum, 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 bum. Let's just deploy these guys here. Okay. So there's my boot coming online. Let's do our little loopy thing. And let's curl it. There we go. That's the namaste, right? And if you remember, I had edited the file, so it has my little V8. On your machine, you won't have the little namaste because you have V1, V2, something like that. Okay, so if you describe the deployment, you'll notice this strategy type rolling update. The rolling update is the default update type, right? That is the kind of the coolest part of it. And so that means whenever you make a change to the image, it just tries to roll it out, okay? Now, you'll notice it kind of rolls it out in a, in a uh, at, at this moment in kind of a unusual way, right? So like if I come here, uh, let's see here, do, do, do. Uh, let's go edit, edit my boot. All right, then the V1, no, it's gonna be V8. Oh, wait, 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 and it's gonna be burr setter right now. There it is. Yeah, that's the one we don't want, RH developers. Let's do this, let's go to one, save and close. And I forgot to close the previous one. That's fine, you got disconnected. But it's gonna roll it out. So you can see it's doing its rolling update now, but it's failing. It's not a clean rolling update, but now it's working. And it's not clean because of the next thing we're about to show you, and that's the liveness probe and redness probe. Let me see, RH developers, V1. All right, let's make it V2 now, save and close. This should go to bonjour. We're gonna get the outage again because the rolling update is not clean. Okay, so this is another piece of the magic. There's bonjour. So how do we make this rolling update thing work? Okay, that's really what we're trying to teach you in this next section. It's called the liveness probe and readiness probe. Okay, if you look here, there's our constraints we just talked about and there's the liveness probe and readiness probe. So here's the way to think of live and ready. One, you have to be live to be ready. So hopefully that makes sense. You don't have to use them together though. You can ignore the live and only do ready or ignore the ready and only do live. But they do have two different kind of distinct uh, capabilities. There's also one called startup by the way too. So startup is a new one that was just added. But live is testing, are you alive or not? That hopefully makes sense. It's testing to see if you're alive or not. The reason this really matters is you could easily have a Java-based app. This is very common in Java-based applications, as an example, where you have pushed it out to a production environment. You've had a programming error where you basically have pulled a connection from a connection pool, database connection, HTTP pool, uh, you know, whatever connection pool you might have in the system. You pulled the connection out, and you didn't correctly use a try-catch-finally block. And therefore, an exception was thrown. And that connection never made it back to the pool. It was just eaten and lost. And so over time, based on how that code gets executed, you may or may not notice this for a while, but at some point late in the day or late in the week or late in a year, depending on how long that JVM has been up and running, you will have a situation where you've eaten all the connections from the connection pool and the app looks like it's running. It's nothing's misbehaving except for every request that comes in from a user hangs because there's no connections in the connection pool to serve it. So it just hangs and pauses and eventually times out. So what an aliveness probe does, it basically talks to your app. In this case, it's gonna to go to the root and, and you can make it whatever URL you want and make it HTTP or not. And, and there's other options beside HTTP. You can basically talk to your app and say, hey, are you alive? And if it responds with a 200, he or she is alive, right? Frankenstein is alive. And then if it, if it doesn't respond, if it responds with an error code or times out, right? See the timeout seconds, then it's not alive. It, in other words, Kubernetes assumes it's not alive. If Kubernetes finds it's not alive, guess what it does? It auto restarts it, okay? And this is kind of awesome. 
So if you have a connection pool kind of error, which is a very common programming error in a Java world, and you've kind of, you know, you have an app that eventually hangs, instead of your ops team having to get an uh, email from the boss to say, hey, the app's hung again, go restart it. And the ops team, that's what they do, right? They get a ticket, they go restart it. Or you get angry tweets from your customers. Hey, I'm trying to get to your API. It's not working any longer. You can, it proactively restarts it, okay? This is a big win, big win by itself. So live, liveness auto restarts when it fails the liveness probe, okay? The readiness probe is slightly different than that. The readiness probe basically says, okay, are you alive? Yes. Okay, now are you ready? Ready means should you be in the load balancer or not? And until you're ready, you're not in the service-based load balancer. That endpoint IP address you saw earlier, that magic doesn't happen, even if the labels are correct, unless you're ready, okay? You got to be ready to truly be part of the load balancer in the service. And then once you are ready, load or traffic comes through to you. So that readiness probe is very important because that's when you receive traffic or not. The startup probe is hopefully well-named. It basically is a, a slight variant of these two options. Startup basically only executes one time. The startup probe, for instance, might have a fairly long initial delay, maybe 30 seconds, maybe 60 seconds, maybe 300 seconds or 3000 seconds, because the startup probe might be doing something like re-indexing a database. This happens a lot when your database crashed and got corrupted maybe in order to bring your database back up, right? It might take three minutes while it's checking its indexes, things of that nature. Maybe you have a Kafka broker that got hammered and went down for some reason. The startup pro basically says, okay, let me let it come up. Let me keep talking to it. Are you up? Are you up? Are you up? Well, let's take five more minutes to get you up. And therefore, what you don't want is super long startups to impact the liveness probe and readiness probe, which are more runtime production probes. Okay, startup probe is just for startup, live and ready and more in, you know, when the thing's up and running. Okay. With these things set correctly, though, you then have a, a working application. So let me apply the right YAML file here. Uh, let's see here. And actually, let's go just get this one. Start up live ready. Let's just pick live and ready for now. Go here it is. Let me go with my image again, V8. Image pool policy always. Again, you wouldn't use that in production, only if not present. But here's the liveness probe, redness probe. So liveness hits on the root, and then the redness probe hits on health. Hopefully, I have a health out there. Otherwise, we'll have some problems. <laughs> okay. So let's go here. By the way, a common error is to misconfigure these URLs and have it wrong, in which case you get all kinds of wonky behavior. Let's try to show you that. So let's kubectl replace dash f. Uh, dun, 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 dun. Put, and it's called my boot, my boot deployment, live and ready, YAML. Okay, let's see if it should be replacing. Okay, it's replacing. Notice, by the way, it's rolling out our new deployment. All right, right now. Okay, and there's our, there's our bonjours. Let's see if it bonjour, bonjour, wait, it shouldn't be bonjour. Oh, there's the namaste. There's the namaste coming through. Okay, let's let it just finish till we get to all namastes. But notice it's, this behavior has already changed slightly. Notice it's not, it didn't immediately just try dumping you into namaste because it is trying to do that liveness check and readiness check before it throws into the load balancer. All right, so we just have a few more Bonjour is still in the production environment. Let's see if it'll cl clean those out and get all namaste. All right, good. I think we're there now. Let me edit that deployment. Uh, colon V8. All right, let's go back to RHG developers. My boot and let's go to back to V1. Save and close. Okay, let's see how this behaves. So it's rolling out the V1 image now instead of that V8 image I created. Notice how slow it's being because the slowness is because it's booting it up, checking the liveness, checking the liveness, checking the readiness, it's checking. Okay, and it only sends you your load through when it's find it valid, right? So it's now Aloha, but not Aloha across the board because it's still rolling out those, um, those pods, right? 
And at some point, it'll eventually overturn all the pods from Namaste to Aloha. And oh, still one more Namaste in play. So the process of rollout is way slower because it's doing it very safely now. Okay, it's doing the rollout uh, from the um, perspective of check, doing those checks. So make sure you have, you have those aliveness probes and radiance probes set correctly. Otherwise, all hell could break loose in your environment. Let's actually test it one more time. So that was V1. All right, so let me go to the, where the V1 was. All right, let me make this V2. Save, close. So now this should roll over to Bonjour and we should, you know, you would see it overturn the previous pods. So it starts up the new pod before it tears down the old pod. So that's a key thing. Start the new pod before tearing down the new pod or old pod. Start the new pod, check its liveness and readiness before tearing down the old pod. And then it goes through all existing pods and does that. So in this case, there's three pods up by default and therefore it's tearing them down one at a time and making sure, you know, live and ready passes before it turns it over from a service standpoint. So there we go, nice clean rolling update. So the magic of the Kubernetes is the rolling updates, right? This is what we pay the big money for, if you will. If we didn't have this in our previous production environments, this stuff was hard. We had to use big IPF5 routers. We had to hire a consultant. We spent days, if not weeks, trying to figure out how to make it work. And then it never really quite worked. This is all part of the Kubernetes ecosystem or part of the Kubernetes solution for free, if you will. But you do got to set the liveness probe and redness probe correctly to get the behavior that you want. So they're nicely overturned. Everybody from Aloha to Bonjour, and we can go back to Namaste if we want. And it all is good from that perspective. All right, Liveness Probe and Redis Probe are your big wins here. Make sure you have those set correctly. Let's see if we can actually break it a little bit. All right, I don't know if we can tell you to do that here. Um, misbehave. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is a good, this is actually, I forgot we added this. So you notice right here, see it's one for one ready. I'm going to exec into that middle pod. Okay, up the middle pod here. Dash dash, bin bash. All right, oh boy, I did something wrong. Oh, it's not the double dash IT, I did that again. Single dash, okay. Curl local host, 8080. All right, see it says bonjour, my boot, RZ29P. That is the one in the middle, good. Got the right one. And I'm gonna call this command called misbehave. Okay. Misbehave means that it's actually, when you curl it, it's gonna give you a slight error. Okay. A slight error. It's gonna give you, No, it's not. why does it say 200 there? Let's see, let's see, let's see. Okay. And, all right, so notice what happens here. See, it's a zero of one because it's misbehaving. Zero of one, it's no longer ready, okay? It's no longer ready. Endpoints, yeah, so the endpoint itself is gone. Uh, oh, let's do this, O oh, wide. So basically four is no longer in the game because it's no longer ready, okay? And let's let's double check on this real quick. So misbehave, it's gonna call, the address is now gone. The, and so this is just the readiness probe we're filling with here, that's the misbehave, okay? So it's gonna basically, see it's gonna be zero of one, no longer ready, and therefore our curl is not gonna see it anymore. This is dropped out. If I come back here and say behave, right? It'll eventually come back around, see that it's behaving correctly, one of one, and now it's part of load balancer again. So now you start seeing RZ29 in there again. So that's an example of the readiness probe, right? You can basically, uh, you can because it's your URL, you can decide how you want it to behave. In this case, um, the misbehave just sets a flag that says return a, uh, an error, okay? The readiness probe, by the way, also can, can be used to deal with your caches. So let's say you want to, before your app runs, you want to connect to a database, cache a bunch of stuff in memory, and then be ready. That's for you to control. You basically can have your readiness probe return a 500 
up until the point where your cache is populated, then return 200, which says you're ready to receive traffic. And then you can kind of, you know, be in or out of the load balancer based on that point. So if I go back to behave here and get our endpoints, you can see now it's added back in. Okay. And let's see if we can blow the liveness probe. Okay. Uh, let's see here. I'm curious to know. Edit deployment, my boot. Let's see if we can make the liveness probe misbehave. Oh, this is the one set with the wrong with Vim instead of instead of uh, VS Code. So let's do this. All right. What is the liveness probe set to? Just double checking. In here, it is set to. Where to go? Uh, it's set to go to root. Okay, it's set to go to root. So, okay, so here's what we'll do. Okay, so instead of going to root, let it go to health, save that. Okay, let it go to health. Health should still be fine. Let's let it roll out. So it's going through its process. You notice the number, by the way, the incrementing number goes back to one when the, the JVM gets restarted. So it is restarting the JVMs upon a rollout. A respawn, if you remember, I said that earlier, everything kind of respawns here. And this should behave as, as, as before. The difference is we're gonna mess with it a little bit. Okay, so there it goes. All right, so we have our three new spring boots, bright and shiny. Let's pick this one in the middle. There's some old ones are still terminating. Let's pick this one. Cube CTL exec IT name of the pod bin bash. Let's see if this works for me. Okay. I'm going to do that curl localhost misbehave trick again. misbehaving and let's see what happens here all right so it's no longer ready so zero of one means it's no longer ready it's no longer part of the load balancer okay And I haven't looked at this code in a while. So let me go, let me, while it's doing that. And, and hello world and spring boot. Let's look at the code. Okay. Let's, um, let's keep that curl running though. Cause that's just interesting. There it is. Oh, 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 oh. and it, and it did it. Okay, <laughs> so we kind of missed it. So let's see, this is subtle, but it's important. So health, health, okay. So health has the behave flag. So if the behave flag is set to false, right? It so if it's set to true, it returns a 200. If it's set to false, right? It returns a service unavailable, which is a 503. So the health command is returning a 503 when this behave flag is set to false, okay? If it's set to true, it returns a 200. Notice the restart one there. So let's try this one more time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's try this one more time. Let's go back into it. Curl localhost 8080. Misbehave. What's happening is because we're misbehaving, it's returning an error. So you're going to see it, the readiness probe fail first. But when the liveness probe fails, you will see the restart increment to two. So there, so it's the readiness probe basically said, okay, you're no longer part of the load balancer, you're misbehaving. But then eventually the liveness probe comes around and goes, hey, you're really misbehaving, let me restart you. The fact that it restarts us though, resets that flag to behave as opposed to misbehave and therefore it comes back normally, All right? But you, should, so in other words, it should be gone until we have a situation where it goes restarts two. So that's what we're looking for there. Uh, let's see if we get endpoints. All right, so there's our two endpoints. Restarts two, see it now? And then, and oh, by the way, you notice my exec got kicked out because the pod got restarted. So my exec got kicked out. 
And now you see there's three endpoints because it passed its liveness probe and readiness probe. So where'd our curl go back? So if we back to curling again, we should see all three. All right, so there should be all three in there and they are. Okay, fantastic. So, you know, you, you want to spend some time thinking about that live and Redis probe are very important, very important items. Okay, we got a few minutes left. Okay, I think we actually go to 545 according to the schedule. I'm just double checking that to be sure. Yeah, yeah, there's a final comment and keynote at six. So we go to 545 here. The, if you guys are still with me, God bless your souls. You guys are real troopers sticking in there, all you folks because you know, this is my numbing hard stuff. And some of you basically say, you know what? I go, I'm gonna take the tutorial and do this on my own time, right? I know you guys are, you know, you're suffering from all this sort of thing. Uh, all right, Brandon's still there. All right, I get blisters on my fingers. <laughs> okay, yeah. So what we wanna show you now is a couple more things, okay? Because there are some pretty interesting things that you should just be aware of. One is how do you deal with configuration? Okay, configuration in the form of config map, environment, and secrets. And I noticed that when we did the secret section, we knocked out the environment variable one. Okay, so I need to come back and add this, this document, by the way, used to be all over here in Nine Steps to Awesome. And originally it was my set of ASCII docs. And, but when we've started migrating it to a common repository, but let me give you this one, because this talks about the environment. Okay, because what we want to do is kind of say, how do you deal with configuration? Now, this is super important. So how do you deal with configuration? There's the config map, there's environment variables, and there's secrets. Because what you want is the behavior of your application to change based on your, uh, based on your environment. So in other words, I want to run this in development on Minikube, but I want to run the exact same code uh, on in my staging environment. And my staging environment might not connect to my SQL, might connect to Oracle, or if I might want to have a different uh, URL for the connections to my database, to my message broker, I might want to just have simply a different config. Now, this is all part of the 12 factor apps, right? So 12 factor apps is what who pushed this idea. So in other words, you externalize configuration so you don't have to change code. I make this point because I run into lots of teams who literally in their Git repository or subversion repository have a branch for development of the same code, a branch for QA, a branch for staging, and a branch for production. Because in order to change the configuration, they literally have to change the code, and therefore they have to change the configuration by changing the code. This, of course, is horrible. They are suffering from this process because every time they want to make a change, they got to make it across four different branches because the production one is slightly different than the staging one, which is slightly different than the QA one, which is slightly different than the development one. The goal is to externalize all that configuration using some form of environment variable. And then you get those environment variables from this thing called a config map. Okay. So let me come back over here. That, uh, my boot deployment. Uh, that, let's ignore that. Configure, set, and I'm just looking at this here. Let's go. Is this the right file even? My boot deployment, I don't even think that's the right file. Let's look at it, the right files. Uh, not that. Let's go here. So resources, resource limits, configuration. Okay. So it's gonna pull the my boot v1. Notice it says config map ref my config here, right? So environment from config map ref my config. So in other words, pull environment variables out of a config map called my config. Okay, this does mean we got to deploy the uh, configuration, uh, the config file. Let's see where it says to do that. Yeah, 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 that, all that. Uh, create the config map. All right, so create the config map. Okay, from the config map, my config, from environment file, apps config some properties. Do you see the apps config some properties? So there's actually two little files in here. Let that be for now. Okay, under apps, config, some properties, other properties. So in other words, we have some properties here. It's just a properties file. But if you have a Spring Boot application and you want to override the application of properties, you basically just have to, you can create another properties file that's separate from it, load it into the config map, and then these values will overlay the values in your application of properties, right? So just like an environment variable overlays it, that's because these are environment variables. So that's how you might set your environment variables is through this config map. And if we look at the uh, code, let's go ahead and replace the code. 
um, apps, compute files, my boot, deployment, configuration, YAML. Okay, let that roll out. Let's take that O wide off so it's a little bit cleaner, easier to read. Configuring, oh, I don't have the config map out yet. So let's get the config map out there. Uh, let's see here. So it is gonna have an error until we, the config map exists. So let's make sure we have it. There we go. Now, you notice we, we issued our deployment before we had our config map and that gave us an error. But it did eventually come back and say, okay, it's running. So here's another thing about Kubernetes that kind of will break your brain a little bit. And that is kind of, it has this reconciliation loop. It's trying to fix itself. So even though our config map was missing and therefore we got an error, once we did have the config map, we didn't have to redeploy. It basically, oh, okay, I'm good. And it redeployed on its own, right? Uh, it kind of figured that out a little bit later. So let's see here, kubectl get services. Do we still have the service here? kubectl get endpoints. Yep, there it is, that's the one. Okay, let's try our curl command again. Yeah, let's see there. Okay, fine. That one says jumbo in this case. The reason it says jumbo is because in the greeting jumbo, right? Greeting environment variable. If we go look at that code over here, greeting, the, it's going to environment get property greeting. It's going to put the word default there. If it doesn't find a greeting, it loads the greeting into the string. And then of course you now have that string. So if we call the configure URL, you'll see what its properties are. Okay, so let's actually do that real quick. Let's come over here and let's let that go here. And actually, let's just let that spin. That's always fun to watch. Curl that and configure. Oh, I have the word curl in there twice. All right, let's do this. Dun -dun 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 curl. Oh, 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 I don't have this environment variable set correctly. So let's do this. Nope, type it correctly, Burr. Here we go, curl. There we go. So see, it says uh, jumbo and a more. That comes from the properties file, and this says default and default because that's what the config map says. Okay. So if say configure, that's what we got. Okay. Now let's actually load in the other. So we had we basically pulled in some properties. Let's change that config map. Where that command go? All right, let's see if we, let's just try a replace on it. Sometimes replace won't work and you'll get an error. Uh, let me see, and this was called other properties, I think. Let me double check. Some properties, other properties, right? So now we should set the other two values. Uh, no, you can't replace, All right? So let's do this. Let's uh, kubectl get cm, kubectl delete cm my config. All right. And let's just create the other properties. Okay. I think I did that correctly. That looks good. Looks good. kubectl get cm. Okay. Well, let's make sure that we, let's just go and bounce our pod to make sure it picks up the, well, actually, let's call the configure. Okay, it's still the old settings. But let's bounce our pod so it picks up the new configuration. Uh, delete pod. Okay. Let it come back up. All right. Call that configure endpoint again. And there it is. So they, you know, so basically we now set the other two values. So the point of this is you can use the config map as a way to store your environment. And then your config map is a separate entity that you can also, by the way, it also is a bit of YAML if you want it to be. <clears throat> uh, so get CM, get CM, my config, oh, YAML. And you can basically have this thing living in your um, source code repository also. So in other words, this could be your config map for staging, your config map for production, your config map for development. And then of course you would just change that file save it back to your source code repository. And then that's the one you load when you want to load it into a certain type of environment. Maybe you have a Minikube version as an example. Uh, and the reason that might matter 
<clears throat> by the way, is because if you look at some of these settings, okay, uh, here's a good example where this really might apply and it's slightly different than config maps. But if I say edit deployment, my boot, okay. And here, if I look at replicas, in, in development, my replicas is almost always going to be one, right? I don't need, unless I'm experimenting, I don't need it to be more than one. Uh, but in production, it's almost always at least two, if not three. In development, my memory and CPU is always going to be pretty low, right? One CPU, 400 megs of RAM. In production, it's going to be one CPU, two CPU, five CPUs, and more memory. So you're going to have situations where you want to adjust these settings for your environment. This is, by the way, is not based on a config map. This is based on the manipulation of YAML itself. And it's something called customize. Okay. Uh, dun, 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 dun. So customize. So when you do cube control applied dash K and you'll see a customization file there. I'll show you an example of what that looks like. It's not in this base class. It is in the more advanced classes that we have. Let's see, Red Hat Scholars. We're kind of sitting between two organizations, by the way, Red Hat Scholars and Developer Demos. Let me see, this is the Tecton one, this one. Uh, let's see here, is it? Uh, the, nope, not here. Where do we have it? We have some more advanced examples. And I gotta remember where one is. And we have a question. What about secrets? Okay, we'll talk about secrets in a second. That is coming up. I'm just trying to show you an example. Of customize. And it's a dash K instead of a dash F. And oh, it's not here. Back in. Here's our, our dun, dun, dun. see this customization.yaml. That's the file it's going to look for, and you use a dash K, but it allows you to do these wildcard replacements throughout your YAMLs. So you can do the things like the replicas and things of that nature that I mentioned. Uh, customize. You can also use Helm, right? So Helm is another solution that people like in the space. Helm charts. And so people use Helm a lot to interact with their Kubernetes cluster, which help, helps them deal with this templating. Okay, on the question of secrets though, okay? Could you do this with Helm? Okay, so Todd's like, hey, what about Helm? Yes, Helm. So customized, by the way, is built into the kube control command line tool itself. So dash K as opposed to dash F, and it looks for those customization files. And so therefore people have kind of just started using customize because it's kind of what they already have. You don't have to install another tool like Helm. But Helm, of course, was the most popular solution prior to uh, doing this. So, you know, if you come over here and look at the, um, uh, if you want to try Helm and you're new, I'd just come check out the quick start guide for Helm. It's pretty awesome. You can work, it should work right with the mini cube you've just set up here. All right. So you could use the Helm. And then for customize, let's see, customize. I don't, I have not actually looked for a, Customize getting started. I've tried the Helm one, works great. Uh, using customize. Yeah, so again, dash K. All right, so check that out, okay? A nice, nice way to deal with wildcards, things like that. If you have an OpenShift environment, it supports those solutions that we just saw, but OpenShift also has a concept of templates. So if you think about it from an enterprise standpoint, you're going to have a dev staging production. And so we've always had the concept of templates from the very beginning with an OpenShift as our Kubernetes distribution. All right, so let's talk about secrets. Okay, now this is important because secrets are going to be kind of funny. Okay, we got those things. We got our secrets. Okay, describe. I'm just looking here to see what it says to do. Okay, and we want the configuration secret. Okay, all right, all right, all right, all right. Let's, so let's do this, okay? You're gonna create a secret. I'm, on, I'm just gonna say, I'm gonna call this command kubectl create secret generic my secret from literal user, my username, from literal password. So this is kind of the wrong way to do a secret, but here it is, okay? <laughs> we wanna kind of just show you how to 
set up a secret. So let's do that. Create secret, kubectl get secrets. All right, so we have the secret called my secret there. That is super awesome. So there it is. So it's kind of like a config map. It's its own object. And it's because it's its own object, you should know how to treat it special. Okay, so if we say describe it, okay, you notice we, uh, it says password is 10 bytes. So it doesn't just show us the password. It says the password is 10 bytes. The username is 10 bytes. Okay, so it is kind of encrypted, but it's not really encrypted. All right, if you do the OYAML version of it, let's see right there. See, the encryption is not really encryption. It is just encoding. Okay, it's base64 encoded. So if you have a base64 tool, you can easily decode it. Okay, so it's not encrypted. So, but this is where you really would put your user IDs and passwords is in a secret, not a config map. And the whole point is, that way, everybody involved in the production management of your Kubernetes cluster knows secrets are something to be kept secret. Well, config map, eh, if it gets out in the wild, it's not too, it's not a big issue if somebody like a developer figures it out, right? But you don't want a developer to know your secrets that are actually from production. So the fact you can keep these things as two separate objects, so get CM versus get secret is a key aspect of it, okay? It's just purely a separate place to keep the configuration information, in this case, a secret, okay? Now there's some other things that you should be aware of. So you can, you know, again, we're using the base 64 decode, so you can always decode it, all right? So the next question is, wait, how do you make it really encrypted, okay? How do you make it really encrypted? So there's a bunch of different options out there. So Kubernetes uh, secrets encrypted, okay? A lot of options there. So you can encrypting, you know, you might want to check out how to encrypt it here. But what a lot, what everyone really uses is this thing called Vault. Okay. Let's see, blah, blah, blah. You know, you know how to how to keep your secrets secure in Git. Uh, and of course, there's lots of ways you can do that. And that's just Git stuff. But let's see here. So Vault. So HashiCorp Vault is what a lot of people use for their way of encrypt, truly encrypting their secrets, okay? Uh, so that's a great tool that people like to use uh, to deal with the encryption side of it. Because by default, a secret is not encrypted. We kind of make that point here. It's just base64 encoded. So uh, it's important that you understand that. Okay, so we got that secret, you know, can pull it out. Now, how does the secret make it into the pod? Okay, it doesn't actually go in as an environment variable. By default, it goes in as a volume mount. Okay, so it actually shows up on the file system on the disk uh, and gets written to a certain location. So let me get this, let's apply this deployment. Okay, and let's actually go look at it real quick while it's loading up. So the configuration with secret. Okay, notice there's a volume mounts and it's gonna say my stuff, secret stuff, true, volumes, my secret volume, secret, secret name, my secret. So this my secret is the name of the secret itself. Okay, so if I say kubectl get secrets, we call it my secret. That's here. We want to basically make it a volume. There's a volume out. So basically what happens is your secret stuff is going to show up on in my stuff, secret stuff. All right. So let's kind of go find that out. Let's go to kubectl exec it. This is the pod in question, dash dash, bin bash. Let's curl localhost. I always like doing that, say, is it, is it what I think I have? Okay, so it's Aloha this time. Okay, and my stuff, ls, secret stuff. There it is, cat password, my password, cat user. There it is. So notice it's no longer even encoded over here, it's in clear text. But in this case, it is volume mounted in, and therefore you can easily go read it from the local file system to know what that secret stuff is, and then apply it accordingly. Okay, so that's another way to get configuration in the outside world, from the outside world into your pod, is using the concept of a secret, and of course this volume mounting trick. I think there are other tricks to it, I just can't remember them all at this point, but just know that's how you set it up, and it's pretty straightforward, okay? Now, for how to get those secrets working. Uh, so that secrets versus config map, and of course, environment variables. 
uh, are all different options there for you to configure your code and make it behave accordingly. Let's talk about operators now. And the reason I want to talk about operators is because it's actually a really good thing to get your head around in order for you to kind of get ready for the next level. All right, let's see here. Cube and S, where are we at? Cube, let's delete namespace, that all right one. Let's just get rid of that one. You can see that pod terminate. Just clean it out, get rid of all the secrets and config maps and whatever else we had in there, just wipe it all out. So the nice thing about wiping out the directory is it wipes out all the stuff inside it. All right, now let's talk about CRDs. If I do a cube control get CRDs, all namespaces here on my on Minikube, notice it says no resources found. I'm going to paste this into chat so you can kind of look at the command. kubectl get CRDs all namespaces. If I do it on my uh, Google cluster, my OpenShift cluster, watch what happens. An amazing list comes out. Okay. So remember earlier when we talked about this concept of etcd, and actually let me I have another diagram. Here we go. Okay. Remember, you're using the cube control command and you're saying create deployment, create pod, create replica set, create service. That's every time you use that API through the cube control command, it's writing it to the etcd database. Okay. And then of course, some scheduler, or some controller basically is watching the database and going, oh, there's stuff you'd like me to do. I want to spin out a new pod or spin out a new deployment or spin out a replica set, spin out a new service. So basically that's what you're dealing with here. Okay. And in the case of a real pod, it goes to the kubelet and essentially does a Docker run on your behalf. All right. That's essentially what the workflow is uh, of what's happening in all the magical po components. If you have a CRD, you can extend the schema, if you will, of this etcd database and the API server to have this new object type. And the reason this super matters if you're new to Kubernetes is because all the cool stuff is done as customized custom resource definitions, okay? So custom resource definitions are these extensions to the API, extensions to etcd that make all kinds of other magic happen. And that's where your Istio, your Tecton, your Knative, and all sorts of other craziness happens, okay? So I just want you to be aware of it because you're going to be living in this world where, hey, my mini cube doesn't have any CRDs. And that's because it's a vanilla, plain Kubernetes. And you're right. It doesn't have anything super cool about it, right? It's just plain old Kubernetes. But if I say cube control API resources, so you should be aware of this command. Because this command tells you, well, what APIs are available? So you can see even vanilla Kubernetes has tons of stuff in it, right? We already did secrets, we did services, we did a replication, uh, not a replication controller, we did a replica set. Uh, we didn't do PVs, PVCs, but we could have. Uh, we did endpoints, we did config maps. Uh, what else? We did events, right? These are the objects we've been cube control get on, cube control get nodes, cube control get events, cube control get uh, endpoints, right? So we did those commands. That is known as cube control API resources. When you apply a custom resource definition, the API grows, okay? So it grows. So let's actually try that real quick. And, uh, and the reason this matters is because when you get into the crazy stuff, you know, then you'll kind of have a better feel for it. So here's an example CRD. This is it. And by the way, you normally won't create the custom resource definition. You will create the custom resource based on a definition. You typically will let a Red Hat right, create the custom resource definitions and do these custom extensions. But if you want to know how to do it, it's pretty cool. And let's say you might work for a software vendor. You don't work for a big bank or a big government. You work for, you know, Acme Corporation who produces super cool widgets and gadgets uh, and you make pizzas, let's say. So this is how you would do it, okay? So I'm going to come in here and let's create the pizza hat. You notice it's not pizza hut because I figured I would be in some form of copyright violation when I did that. So let's create the pizza hat uh, as an example. Okay, we're in the Pizza Hut, and I didn't really have to be in the namespace yet, but let's add the pizza as CRD. And now I say cube control, get CRDs, there's pizzas now. Okay, that's kind of cool. And so, and actually this CRD concept, if I come over to my OpenShift environment, where'd it go? Yep, I could do it here too. Okay, in other words, the custom resource definition is just an extension of the API, no matter what. Custom uh, get CRDs, grep pizzas. The reason I'm gripping is because this one has a lot of CRDs in it, but now you see pizzas are in my 
OpenShift cluster running on Google as well as in my Minikube. And now I have pizza objects. So I can do things like get cube control, get pizzas. And there are no pizzas, okay? I don't have any pizzas loaded into the system yet, but I have this get CRDs pizzas. If I say cube control API resources and grep looking for pizzas, there we go. We now have pizzas with a short name, a PZ. So I can say cube control get PZ. And it's the same thing as if I had typed out pizzas. So now I have pizza objects as first class citizens in my, in my system. Okay, that's pretty awesome all by itself. This means I can now uh, deploy pizzas. So let's say I deploy a cheese pizza here. So cube control apply dash F and a cheese pizza. And I say Q control get pizzas. There it is. There's a cheese pizza. And if I say describe PZ cheesy P, cheesy P, there it is. You can see it has toppings of mozzarella, but regular sauce. Okay. And now, now, now here's the thing that's kind of interesting about it. So far, all we're doing is creating, reading, and updating data within the database. All right. That's all we've done so far. All right, we, we are just CRUD operations against database, that SCD database. But now we apply an operator, okay? And an operator is just another type of pod that's going to respond to pizzas, okay? So let's go ahead and get it up and running. So there'll be a pod now who's going to respond to those pizza objects living in our database. So this is a custom, an example of a custom controller. And let's see here, while that's, it's doing its container pulling right now. Let's see if I can find my pizzas, uh, pizza operator. Okay, so the P, that's the operator code. And what am I missing? Let me go double check. Pizza app pizzas pizza deployment YAML. App pizzas pizza deployment YAML. Oh, there it is. There it is. There it is. Pizza deployment YAML. Okay, so notice it is a cluster role. All right, so there's additional things here. It has a service account, has a cluster role binding, it has a deployment. So the deployment is what we're used to seeing. There's some additional stuff in related to security. Your service accounts and cluster cluster roles are basically how do you do security without a user involved? Okay, uh, and then we basically see it's going to pull this pizza operator uh, image. So it works just like a normal operator, but it has to have access to the Kubernetes API. So that is why the service accounts are so critical. It has, it's looking at the Kubernetes API and going, hey, do you have pizzas? And if so, what pizzas do you have on board? And therefore it's gonna operate on it. And what happened here is it actually cranked up this cheesy P pod. And if we come over here and say kubectl logs to cheesy P pod, you can see it basically said doing the sauce, adding uh, sauce regular, adding toppings, mozzarella, baking, bake, ready for delivery. And that's all it did, okay? And so it also ran it as a job to complete it. It's not continuing to run because it, it decided it didn't need to continue running. It just had to run that job. You can do it either way. But the nice thing is you now have this concept of pizza objects, kubectl get pizzas. And if we bring other pizzas into the system, okay? So let's actually, Let's try it. See if we can do this fast enough and make it a little bit more fun. So kubectl apply dash F apps pizzas. Uh, let's go with the pizzas. Pizza, pizza, pizzas, pizzas. Let's go with the meat pizza, apply it, stern meat. Let's see if we catch it fast enough. Okay, so we're trying to basically look for the meat pizza. Uh, coming through the system. So the operator is going to see the fact that we've added a new pizza, kubectl get pizzas. And oh man, so my stern didn't miss it. Okay, meat. Stern doesn't work for me here. All right, so kubectl logs and meets pizza pod. Meets pizza pod. There we go. Oh, 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 oh. Didn't got some extra stuff there. There we go. So it added the toppings mozzarella, pepperoni, sausage, and bacon and then baking, baked, ready for delivery. Okay, so you know this is just a fun example to show you kind of how to deal with something that's custom. This does mean that in your company, you can have your own custom resource definitions, your own custom resources. So custom resources are an example of uh, cheesy P. So let's actually look at these files. So here's the CRD, custom resource definition. Okay, that has to get declared and part of the API, but this is a custom resource. This is a specific pizza that I want called meets P. 
Okay, and if I called it meets P bird, that would be its name. Uh, so here, if I save that and let's apply it again, we'll see a meets P burr there, right? All right. So, but the operator is basically saying, look for the record in etcd and spin out a pod uh, to completion, basically ba uh, based on what it saw there. And so if I wanted something else in here, like uh, my wife really likes mushrooms and let's call this meets pizza burr too and apply it again. And kubectl logs meets p burr two pod. There we go. See now mushrooms are part of the equation. Okay, so that is custom resource definitions. The reason this matters so much though is once you have something kind of set up on your environment, you can say things like get Kafka. So I'm gonna come over here to my Kafka one. Okay, there's no Kafka's in here, but let's do this. Dun, dun. Uh, watch cubes and dun, 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 my stuff. Okay, so no Kafka objects, but we got some other stuff running here. Okay, now if I come here and actually let me just do this from the GUI standpoint. So my stuff, I can let me go back to the administrator mode and let me come here and hit operators, installed operators. One of them, so this is what we did earlier with pizzas, but this is more advanced, right? This is more like real world. Let me come here to where it says Kafka and I can say create Kafka and I'll call this my cluster and I'll just call it pizza for fun. There we go. And let's hit create. So this is me doing the same thing with the YAML. All right, so here's the YAML for that. But in this case, what I'm doing is simply building a Kafka object. So what you'll notice is there's my cluster pizza. There's going to be three zookeepers because by default in this version of Kafka, the one we support in production at Red Hat, you have three zookeepers, you have three Kafka brokers. And basically it's building a whole cluster of Kafka objects for me based on that. Okay. Now we're running pretty close on time, pretty short on time. We got to wrap things up. I just kind of want to show you that concept though, because that is how you get virtual services from Istio. That's how you get serverless services from Knative. That's how you get Kafka objects from the Kafka and all these other operators that you would install in your system, right? Elasticsearch, Jaeger, Kiali, which is your, uh, command, uh, your tool for visualizing your uh, service mesh technology, Tecton pipelines. That's what it, you can have as extensions to your um, Kubernetes environment and give you a lot of advanced superpowers. We have tutorials for all of these, by the way. If you look at the Nine Steps to Awesome document, I list them all here. We've just been focusing on this one. By the way, the people's names here, because these are the folks I recently assigned to helping maintain the documents, because it even takes a while for me to maintain them all. So Alex on our team here, and Kamesh, and Sebi, and uh, Elder, et cetera, they've been working on maintaining these documents for us. Uh, if, you, if you go into any of them, uh, so like, let's go to the Istio tutorial here and pop into that repository. It takes you directly to the GitHub. And then the HTML has been spun out here, All right? So now you can do the Istio version of what we just did, okay? And then you can also uh, just file a GitHub issue, right? You can see there's issues here, pull requests that we have to go evaluate. Um, and then, you know, file an issue if you have an issue with it. And these things are always falling out of date, uh, just the nature of the job, right? You know, these, this stuff is moving fast. Okay, do on your own, complete some of these things. You see, you can play with the scheduler. You can see how pods are scheduled through taints or affinity. Uh, you can have jobs. That's kind of like the completed thing you saw earlier. It runs to a certain completion state. It doesn't always stay running. It doesn't stay always on. Damon said stateful set. So if you run databases and stateful technology, you use a stateful set. Uh, again, ingress was down here. If you want to try Minikube ingress, it's actually pretty straightforward. You just do the add-on, but then you got to do some other little tweaks to get to, to work with ingress as an example, but that's all your Kubernetes tutorial. You can see we had to cover a lot of ground in a short period of time. You guys have all the documents. So at this point, you are ready to rock and roll on your own and try these things. Uh, again, use that mini cube uh, to your advantage, or you can go back to that learn.openshift.com for the one hour thing right here. That would give you the one hour if you needed it. Uh, let me put that right here. Dun, dun, dun. One more time. And we are at this point out of time. If there are any closing questions or thoughts, feel free to throw them at me. And let me get out of this mode here. And let's see here. Oh, this popped up over here. I'm actually was monitoring my environment. Now I can see it better. 
But if you have questions, feel free to throw them at me in chat. Can I get the link to nine steps awesome slides? Yes, yes, yes. This nine steps awesome slide deck. All right, let's come back here, add that there. Thank you, Catherine. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Uh, let's see. All right. Other, any other thoughts, questions? Andrew, you like the session? Hopefully it was fun. We did work really hard getting all the documents in place because one thing I always hate when I take a little training class is great. I, I paid attention. I learned as fast as I could, but I really want to try it on my own. And the documents, we work really hard to make sure you can go afterwards and try it as homework and give it a try. Uh, and then, of course, come back and give us feedback later. If you want to track me down, you can always track me down on Twitter or via email. Uh, so here's the Twitter as an example. And at this point, we're going to be breaking out of here and all things open is going into a final comments and wrap up keynote at six o'clock, I think, I assume. Right, Doug? Something's going to be happening over there. <laughs> yeah, I believe it's at six. Yeah, yeah. So a few sessions. From, uh, is that going to be... Um, uh, do, do, do. But do you know who's actually going to be the presenter in that one? I do not offhand. I don't. Okay. But hopefully you guys enjoyed your All Things Open experience. For those who are virtually, I highly encourage you to come to the one based in physical Raleigh. I've been involved with All Things Open, I think, since the very inception. It's a wonderful event. Two or 3,000 people show up physically when we could visit in the real world uh, down to the Raleigh Convention Center. Raleigh's a quaint little southern town if you've not been to it. It's not exactly a tourist attraction except for All Things Open. So I'd encourage you to come to the real event and the future. Uh, it's a quite good economic value and just a lot of fun to see everyone there. Red Hat's often a sponsor and therefore I often try to be there. Thank you guys so much.